Hello, everybody, and welcome to Dungeons and Developer Insights, the show where I sit down with some of the developers from Dungeons and Dragons Online and talk about video games. Today, I'm joined by No No Bob. I believe you're a senior content designer. Is your uh, that title? is correct? Yes, senior, I am yeah. a senior a senior content designer over on uh, uh, over on at SSG. Um, I'm currently working on Dungeons and Dragons Online, and I've been having a really good time. So, so what is senior content design? What do you do? Um, so. For the most part on Dungeons and Dragons Online, what I do is uh, I make dungeons. And by I make dungeons, um, there are some uh, there are some small parts and larger parts that we can do. Um, uh, sometimes it's everything from building the uh, the la the basic layout uh, hmm. to uh, f from from the very start to the very end and doing every single piece of content. Sometimes it's a little less. Sometimes we have folks which do. Uh, uh, which do a lot of that layout stuff for us. Uh, mm. Previously, it was Fans, uh, Fantas. Right now, it's uh, Flimsy Firewood. Um, and they sometimes do a lot of uh, layout and deco stuff just because they're a little quicker at it and uh, a little better. But um, essentially, um, it's really unique. Uh, Dungeons & Dragons, um, when uh, Dungeons & Dragons Online, when you're a content designer, you actually are pretty much responsible for anything that goes into your dungeon. Um, Right. From the uh, from anything from text to writing to encounter building um, to uh, to to monster placement and monster decisions, um, some of the monster setting stuff is a little less up to you. Um, a lot of times that that's kind of in the systems group and stuff like that. But um, mm. but you get a chance to uh, you know build the story, uh, figure out how you want to tell it. Uh, come up with uh, whatever zany and interesting uh, bits and pieces you want to do about it, and uh, go from there. Damn, that was a long answer. Uh, well, it's I good know. to know. Like, I mean, it's, there's I think there's a lot of questions about how stuff goes into the content design because we obviously just you know Isle of Dread comes out. There's 12 quests, and we mm -hmm. just go play the 12 quests, right? So from our perspective. You know, we don't really know who is working on what and how many hands go into it. Uh, it's definitely yep. interesting to know that the Things come in like piece, not so much piecewise, but like different people have different hands, even on an individual dungeon, as you said. Like, you know, maybe yep. somebody's building the actual skeleton of the thing. Maybe someone's putting the art in. Um, yep. I think it's kind of cool. Uh, what dungeons have you worked on recently to give people some context? Okay, uh, so uh, in the most recent pack, when you get a chance to go through it, uh, yep, uh, there's going to be a uh, a quest called uh, Three Paths to Battle, um, okay. and that's going to be the Shavrath themed Eye of Shavrath dungeon. That's okay. the one that I'm working on currently. Um, previous to that, I worked on some of the revamp for uh, Temple. Um, okay. Doing the first, second, uh, so the the breakup of the first dungeon, and then uh, and then the rework of the last dungeon. And oh, then, like the Zuggenmoy part. And then the Zuggenmoy part, and then um, the before that, uh, let's see. I did the Bullywog Dungeon in Isle of Dread. And Everybody I loves all, the Bullywog Dungeon. Lots of traps. Uh, People's favorite uh, part. Uh, I love the Bullywog Dungeon, and I did another one, and I'm trying to remember what it is, and I the don't remember. The Triceratops the Dungeon. Oh, yeah, that's right. Trial of the Triceratops. Uh, uh, those were the, uh, the the two that I did for that. And then before that, I've done a whole bunch of other ones. Oh, um, yeah. I'm, I'm sure there's probably more dungeons that we can kind of count and, and list <clears> off here. You've been working for SSG for, like, a pretty long time. Uh, yeah, um, I took an, a little break in the middle, but um, I started on the project in 2007 as a systems designer. Oh my god! <laughs> and I was there from 2007 yeah, to 2009 time. before I went over to uh, uh, before I went over to Lotro to do some design over there. Yeah. So when it comes to actually, this is a this is a great segue because you've done design for both Lotro and both DDO. Um, mm -hmm. I'm saying I can imagine there's probably like different levels of design constraints, whereas in, in DDO or like Lord of the Rings is very like grounded. You've got all the different story with like the it's got to follow the Tolkien lore and everything is like and you know, you've got guys on horses for the most part is kind of like your your basic design. Whereas in DDO, there's a quest where you're insane. So you build an airship out of furniture to go to space. Mm -hmm. So yep. how would you describe like the different design constraints between the two different kind of games when you're designing well, stuff? Uh, each of the two different games have a uh, uh, essentially because they're licensed products, they have different constraints on the storytelling aspects of them. Mm -hmm. um, so 
Uh, the way that I would describe Lotro is that uh, the amount that you have to be very careful when you're working in that specific space is a little more constrained than it is in Dungeons and Dragons. Um, right. Uh, given the given the fact that while we do work with the licensor and we do have different things, we have we have a lot more creative freedom to kind of go outwards and try to find something that's interesting or compelling. But there is a, an entire like there's a pitch process. Essentially, we're like, hey, um, we want to do like if we think that something is sort of on that borderline, we're gonna like, hey, we want to do this. Is this okay, or should we shy away, or do you have any other suggestions? which would be a little bit more uh, in line. Yeah, that makes um, sense. Yeah. I was curious to like also too, when it comes to the quest lines. So, you know, obviously the planar eyes quests are all very different and they're made by different people. And like some of them are very, very different. Like yes. the, um, what was it? The quest order in the court on the preview. And that quest is unlike any other quest in the entirety of the video game. It's totally unique. Um, yep, absolutely. And it is very different from, uh, like the other one of the other quests, which is the final quest in the chain, when you guys like break down. So obviously there's five quests. They're designed by some different people. Yep. Um, how do you break down like the story and some of the things that kind of tie stuff together? Is it like unanimous decision? Is it like a head that's like, this is what we're doing and kind of break it down? Uh, so normally how it works is uh, we get to the point where we're going to uh, essentially pitch the pack. Uh, mm -hmm. Like what's the main theme that we're going to be doing for the pack in this particular case? Uh, it's we knew that we wanted to kind of wrap up some of the eye story stuff uh, as an intro into sort of what's coming next. Um, we thought that it was a, an important step. And so we're like, okay, um, with that, um, then we make sure that it's okay that we work in this space. But since we had worked in that space, we were a little, we weren't too worried about any problems on the sort of Wizards of the Coast D&D uh, &D side. Right. Um, so then what happens is it's like, hey, here are the different options for different things that we could do for dungeons. Here yeah. are, I think, I think it was seven eyes that we have left over. You still who, have seven eyes. Yeah. Yeah. Who has interest in doing a dungeon in these seven eyes? And if it's one of these seven eyes, is there one that you feel particularly drawn for? Or if there's something that uh, you, you particularly actually want to go for, mm -hmm. um, then you can take that and, and just, and then the next portion is, uh, what we want to do is have a brief overview of back and forth of what do you think you're going to do with this? And this happens during sort of the pitch meeting when we're discussing like, oh, hey, I'm thinking about doing this. Have people tried doing this sort of thing? Have they had problems doing this? And right. um, so you get so it's sort of a back and forth different thing, like in in the particular case of the um, uh, uh, of doing the, the the order of the court dungeon, the person mm -hmm. which was working on that is like. I have this idea and this is what I want to do and uh and this is what we want to go for and, yeah. and and we're like well that's you know uh like that is a fun interesting idea it might be a little bit tough to to put across but like you know if that's something that you feel passionate about and you want to try to do we can go ahead and uh yeah we totally support that go for it um if we need to you know modify it or work on it or you need help with it yeah. Uh, go forth and uh, and go destroy. Um, so then, uh, does that mean that you had an idea for Chevra at the battleground, or was this a case of well, you know, you were the last one to to pick, so you got Chevra? Um, in my particular case, um, I didn't feel really strongly about any of the the, the different themes. Like uh, in this particular case, I didn't like there wasn't one that was like, yes, I must work on this. Mm -hmm. Seeing that I've done a bunch of work on a, a bunch of different Chevra. Dungeons, I figured that I had a decent idea. I was like, hey, this is my pitch for the dungeon. Um, essentially, what you have to do is you have to go to uh, a small outpost slash fortress for each of these different uh, groups, and you have to essentially get a ward from, uh, uh, get attuned to a ward. Um, and essentially, all the wards will never be able to be taken by them because essentially, if at any point one of their forces has two of them, the other two groups will will fight it off and it's sort of like moving along with the eternal battle sort right, of thing. exactly which, of Shavrath, yeah which, which honestly is a little bit of a bummer and you know i feel bad for those because there's no point like there's no point to anything that they're doing and so you just kind of feel bad for everyone involved in that entire like yeah they're just they're uh, just stuck they can't do anything yeah oh that's funny um oh uh, you wait. So did, does that mean uh, what was it? There was the Archon's trial. So there was like uh, the, I, 
Did you, uh, did you that, do any of those? Of, of that group, I did uh, Demon Assault. Demon Assault, okay, yeah. Which is the portals and the Shavrath blitz And the blades, blades swirling around. Everyone yeah, loves yeah, those yeah. swirling blades, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think you're being a little facetious, but, you know... I actually uh, find it very funny because it's you know, they they have very clearly defined patterns and how they move, and mm -hmm. if you know those patterns, you can just stand in certain places and never worry about it. And it's for me, it's very entertaining to watch people like they get hit and then they panic and then they got to run around and do something, uh, and uh, then they just run into more blades. Well, and, uh, and in that particular case, that's something that I like to do uh, with those particular blades is because uh, it, as long as it's something like a learned behavior and an improved behavior then then go for it like it, mm -hmm. it's a type of thing i don't want it to be like the central most important piece of something that you're going to be doing and avoiding but like it has a little shavrath flavor i mean one of my notes on this last thing is i need to add more shavrath flavor which meant i had to add a, a couple of uh, uh you know the shavrath blades uh, there you and, go uh, just put them everywhere <clears throat> uh no nah, not so much uh i have them in a couple of the opening rooms uh where the spaces worked and all of that sort of stuff I mean, I am still waiting for the the trapped chest where you pop open the chest and it's not actually a chest. It just pops out Shavrath blades. Oh, um, nice. Nice. I like that. I like what you're thinking. Yeah. It reminds I me like of this. Because there's, there's an old video of someone on the... I was not on Hardcore, fortunately, but they drank a potion of wonder at the end mm -hmm. of uh, Tempest Spine while they were looting the chest and spawned yep. Shavrath blades killing almost everyone on the chest. Uh... So, that is and it, so and it, wonderful. It makes me so happy. Yeah, and so I'm like, I wonder if you could just do that in a quest. Just straight up get somebody. Uh, could you do that? Yes. Uh, it would take a little doing, but I, I know how I would do it. Um, and uh, and it's kind of fun. You know, you could do different things like that. Like, um, uh, you know, maybe uh, like something like that. You could absolutely do it. So question, I guess, a little bit more about how, like, the sausage is made. Obviously, yep. you guys are, um, you know, you, you work with your own proprietary software for constructing things and what have you. Yep, um, yep. How much of it, like, obviously, there's going to be some, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a programmer. I'm just some guy on the Internet who plays the game. Um, mm -hmm. So does somebody need to have, like, a very highly technical background to build these dungeons? Like, how much actual, I guess, programming knowledge and stuff do you need? Or is it all kind of like you guys <sighs> build it with your with your own tools? How does that work? Uh, so for the most part, uh, the answer is that the um, it doesn't require a pretty like a, a high level of programming. A little bit is good. Um, we mm -hmm. essentially have a proprietary scripting system, which um, which we use a fair deal. And as long as you kind of understand the basic premises of that scripting system, um, you can do a pretty wide array of different uh, bit pieces. Um, I mean, one of the nice things about our editor is that you know, uh, we have a decent amount of flexibility and things of that stuff, but like the actual technical know-how, um, it is very few and far between that I actually write real, real code. Yeah. Um, I, I sometimes look at code, um, but it's more because I'm curious of how something is working or things of that sort of stuff. I don't have a coding background. I don't even have a college degree. Um, I, uh, and, uh, so most of the stuff that I do, I do a lot of work in, in our visual editor, uh, which is uh, called World Builder, um, mm -hmm. and then a lot of the other work that I do is either in Notepad++ or Excel. Uh, and that is the vast majority of my work. Yeah, because it reminds me of like, um, back in the day, I remember just installing the old Morrowind disc, and it came with the, also the, the tool set, so you could like edit and build your own stuff. And I'm um, mm -hmm. obviously imagining you guys probably have more in-depth tools than that, but you know, something like that for actually building and constructing things. Um, yeah, uh, and in a lot of cases, what it is, it's a, it's a visual, uh, it, it's essentially a, a, a visual, uh, a visual programming, uh, work that people had built the tools many, many years ago, mm -hmm. um, uh, in the lands of turbine way back when, but it's, it's super great. Like it's, uh, it, it's really flexible. It has a lot of, uh, decent bells and whistles. Um, yeah. I, I think that's uh, one of the things that a lot of people get confused about probably between like the how many people make video games and how or like how it, it gets made in general because like yep. obviously you have like engineers and programmers who can build yep. programs but these people may not be artists and might not know yep. anything really about game design so you know they can build the tool but then like designing a dungeon is a it's a totally different skill set 
Oh yeah, absolutely. And and it's one of those things is like, uh, I'm very blessed. I've, I've been able to do this game design gig for, you know, 15, 16 years, uh, a little bit more than that now. Um, but, uh, uh, but like the different groups of people that you need to actually put this together and to make this go, uh, like we have some fantastic, incredibly intelligent engineers. We have some amazingly cal uh, talented artists. Uh, all of those folks doing a wide array of work that I could not do. Um, I could yeah, attempt. Me neither. It, it would be laughable. Um, it's it's always funny when someone's like, "Hey, I see that you're in the stream. You're having we're having this the, this problem with the server." And and the thing that I can assure you at this very moment is that if there is a technical problem with the programming of our game, the last thing in the world that you want me to do is to be looking at it or attempting to uh to actually yeah. do uh any changes to that code because um that's really fraught with peril yeah exactly i kind of i kind of think of it of like you know you you have like a hospital right and then it's like oh there's an issue with the power grid quick you grab one of the doctors and you're like hey can you fix can, can you fix the uh you know the fuses are all broken here and there's something wrong with the power line can you fix it and the guy's like uh like very smart knows what they're doing can't don't handle that task that's uh that is definitely not in in my uh you know sphere of influence for a lot of different things now granted i've been doing this for a long time i have mm -hmm. a uh, i have a background way back when in qa um uh mostly on the lotro side but like yeah. uh, i have that sort of uh backdrop and so i've like i have an understanding of how a lot of the underpinnings of things have worked or you know 12 years something went haywire and i happen to remember this one thing this one command which we may have used and sometimes that's helpful <laughs> yeah i guess it's got to be a situation where like it helps to have that experience with other people and and their roles because then you for yourself when you need something so if you're designing a dungeon and you need a monster or you need to change a system or something else that you can't do yourself you either know who to go for and also how long it's going to take and how often you're going to get the answer of uh no uh, you know, figure something else out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, uh, and sometimes, I mean, like when we were back in the office, uh, right now we're working remote. Um, uh, you know, sometimes the best thing I could do is when, you know, people were having rough days is, you know, go out and get them dinner and be like, Hey, do you need anything? How can I support you? How can we make this happen? And, you know, things will go, things will go sideways over the course of different stuff. Mm -hmm. um, there's there's stuff that happens. It's frustrating. It's frustrating for the players. It's frustrating for us as developers. Uh, and the person who is is the most responsible for it, the way that they feel is just they're crushed. And so they're working really hard to fix things, but they also feel that weight. And yeah. so anything as, as a fellow developer or something like that, that you can make things just a little bit easier on them, then uh then that's like the most important thing and it's one of the things that you have to be like really cognizant like if you mm -hmm. don't have that sort of development atmosphere well then that's probably not a place you want to be. yeah that, yeah that absolutely makes sense at ssg <clears throat> do you guys have like because i imagine not everybody is a content designer because people don't do content yep. is there like almost either like some rite of passage or something where somebody has to design some amount of of ddo content like oh somebody has to design a night revels dungeon or something like that um so no however um, someone that we that eventually we get to see like everybody's got their own personal dungeon that they put together uh however any person which is hired as a content designer one of their first tasks normally is putting together a night revels dungeon or very sh uh fairly shortly afterwards like the next time night revels comes around uh they will be building a night revels dungeon like um uh, one of the people uh, built uh, Gravework, which was the rework of Framework, which is framework, was, yeah, which is awesome and fantastic, and and you can kind of see them as they go through. But like, it's one of those things is that we do let people take a stab at doing some of the stuff from the other group if they feel really passionate about it. Mm -hmm. However, one of the challenges with that is that a lot of times um, some of those folks have a really deep understanding of sort of what they're looking to do. And they're like, I have this really crazy concept of this this really cool thing that I want to do. Um, and as content designers, or as someone which has been doing this for a long time, 
the thing that I would caution people about some of that stuff, I'm like, just do a basic dungeon first so you can understand yeah. the challenges, the drawbacks, the problems that you run into as you're just trying to do the most basic building block so that you can go on from there. Yeah, and it's going to be like that, any task, right, though? Like where yep. you, if you've never done something and you're like, yeah, I could totally do this major project. And then you get 10% through and realize, oh, I can't do any of this yet. Or it's just way bigger piece than it's something you are way big. Uh, sorry, you bit off way more than you could chew. I mean, way back when, uh, when I first worked in systems on DDO, um, Aladrin was the lead. And uh, he is still to this very day, one of my very closest friends. Um uh, he lives out in Sweden. Awesome, awesome dude. Mm. Uh, has a really cool gig, uh, I think, working for the folks that do Stellaris. Um, I think he's a design oh, cool. director or something like that over there. Um, awesome dude. Anyway, um, my first day, he's like, okay, um, you need to make items. I'm like, okay, okay. that's sweet. Uh, so so cool. let me take a look at that. And he's like, well, here's the Excel files where you get to well, make an item. You should uh, learn how to make an item from that. Because uh, I have the work of about three people, and I'm going to be doing that over there, and uh, that's the luck. And, you know, every once in a while, uh, these days were a little kinder than that, but back then, uh, really, they were so underwater with systems tasks. Yep. Uh, that's sort of where it was. And uh, we try yeah, not we need to need more kindling these... for the fire. Quick, jump in. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and, you know, there's a little bit of panic that, that first day. You're like, okay, how does this work, and how do these systems work? But then you start looking through it, and... Um, a lot of our stuff, um, especially if we're working in the Excel documents or, or those things, like if you plot along, you can kind of look to see, oh, this is a reference to this. This is this and this and this. Uh, and yeah. this. Um, a wide array of the different items that are made in our game are actually just text. Files. Oh, yeah, so, absolutely. And just like some, yeah. hundreds, like thousands and tens of thousands of little text files. Like a lot of it's read into like brought up to databases and it's built in all this sort of stuff but it's really funny when you look at stuff you're just like oh hey this is these are the 10,000 text files or 20,000 or 40,000 or 100,000 text files that make this uh, you know all put together yep oh man actually it's just it it's like I said for me I always get excited about hearing about how the sausage is made because then it's either surprising because you're like wow this is super complicated <clears throat> or sometimes you're like that's very simple Yep. I guess that makes sense. That that would be the easiest way to do it. Yeah, um, and and I mean, one of the challenges uh, when when you're kind of getting into it and when you're sort of uh, putting this stuff together, like a lot of times there are tasks that you want to do which aren't the most complicated task or time intensive tasks, but you you literally have four other things on your plate and mm -hmm. that plate will very quickly fill up and you're like, oh, I just want to go back and fix that. Prioritization. Yep, and you don't have enough time or, you know, schedules get stuff or, you know, every once in a while. Surprise, we're going to redo, uh, you know, uh, Temple of Elemental Evil. Yeah, Temple of Elemental Evil revamp. Um, yeah, yeah. Actually, we, we're just on the subject. Uh, why? Uh, what why happened? Temple? What yeah, there's because I knew there was supposed to be like <clears throat> a revamp of an old content pack that was going to become a legendary content pack. We knew about that from the... Uh, yes. From the outset, from the producer's letter, and also, so, uh, you know, Tolero spoke about it when she was on here before. Uh, so, uh, Temple of Elemental Evil, first of all, mm. we love the setting. We love the classic feel. Oh, um, yeah, it's the, great. The The play hours and the play time for that specific experience were not where we would want to see it in any way, shape, or form. Because when we built it, we built it, it was our second classic pack. Uh, after it was after um, Haunted Halls, right? Halls. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and it was our first like big, huge scale thing, and we were still learning on how to do content. And I mean, even if you look back and look at Slavers, like what would make Slavers more fun? Well, that being six dungeons rather than <laughs> than three super freaking long ones. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's but, that second dungeon is uh, <clears throat> it's a long one. Uh, yeah, yeah, and you gotta put and, on the running shoes for that one. Yeah, and. That's mine, and I feel awful about it, but the problem was that there were enough in interesting pieces that I didn't know where to cut. Nowadays, I would look at it and be like, that midpoint where you jump down and then the first thing you run into is that freaking amazing magnet trap. I'm so happy how that came out. Oh, I love uh, the like magnet that, trap. Th like, that's an awesome start to a dungeon. I would chop that in half, 
Uh, it would take a bunch of work, but you know that would be something that I would want to do. But uh, yeah, that's a great midpoint actually. That would that's a perfect two dungeons as opposed to yeah, one. yeah, like and um, but but that's the sort of thing. And one of the things that we've been looking at is as a company when we're designing content, what's more interesting and more compelling for players. And one of the things that while we do from time to time have longer pieces of content. Um, it just seems like the run rates and the size of content, uh, if it's if we can get it between 20 to 30 minutes, that's much closer to what we sort of want on the long side um, for players which, you know, are first experiencing it rather than 45 minutes or an hour or an hour and a half. I mean, yeah. there are some dungeons which you walk into and they, they take a long, long, long time. Now, granted, that explor uh, exploratory uh, process is super fun. It can mm -hmm. be very neat, but it could also be very frustrating. And you're just like, I just want this to end. I just, yeah. I just want to be done so I can move yeah. on to the next thing. Or, hey, this particular dungeon is a real challenge, and it's a bottleneck for this entire expansion. So it really depends on the specific, uh, you know, piece of content. So yeah, um, it depends too, because like, <clears throat> I even the other day I was complaining about how I don't really like haunted halls of Evening Star because I don't know it that well. So for me, yep. it's like an hour and something experience. But somebody else yep. was saying like, oh, I do that in like six to eight minutes every every past life. And I'm like, I I mean, I don't know the way through. So it's like a huge undertaking for me, whereas some, for somebody else, it can be like nearly instantaneous. Um, yeah. And yeah, it kind of like I like the fact that you guys have been designing shorter dungeons, if I'm being honest. Like yep. on average, the dungeon length has been getting shorter as opposed to longer. Um, yep. I actually much prefer that because it means you can do more different things as opposed to just doing more of the same thing. Um, yeah. And it gives a uh, it gives us the ability to do a wider array of different types of content and touch uh, a couple of different pots. I mean, one of the things that I think that was uh, super successful in Salt Marsh was the sort of non-main storyline quests. Um, I was lucky enough to uh, to be working over on D on Lotro and then being like, "Hey, we need a bunch of help to do this," and I put together the four non-connected mini dungeon or uh smaller dungeons in that pack which were the bullywugs the yep uh Bully the, the, Quest Sahag is a good one. the, the sahagwin non super long one uh uh the uh and then the campfire one and then campfire uh, one, yep. uh and then the cult in the basement waking up the vampire who's super cranky uh, oh i i love that quest the ending dialogue is just like chef's kiss it's amazing where you go up uh, and you that and the thing is just like yes and you'll release me and your character's like no i'm not gonna do that I'm like oh fair enough all right yeah 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 he well he was really hopeful i mean honestly he was just a vampire trying yep. to enjoy his in his eternal uh slumber and you know uh he he was you know kind of put into this place and he knows he's never going to escape and uh you know he he thought he was in the safest place ever. And then an annoying cult comes and moves in and is bothering him. Yep. And he doesn't know how to help. Help. So uh, he just starts sending dreams to uh, local townsfolk, hoping that they'll, uh, you know, put a stop to the annoying cult. And there you are. And there you are, just walking right in the middle of it. Yep, yep. Um, I was going to ask uh, specifically about that. Do you guys have, like, play statistics, like internally do you track that like how many how many times each dungeon is loaded into how long people spend in the dungeon that sort of thing or do you not um, keep track of those metrics uh we do keep track of those metrics uh it isn't something that we uh, actively use a great deal um but it's essentially as time allows and we can pull it and we can kind of look through it uh we do um yeah because uh, i just i would have imagined that would have been one of the driving factors behind temple of elemental evil it's probably easily one of like the least quest least least run quest chains in the game yeah and then also and, has like an amazingly long time. I'm, I'm just trying to imagine what the average runtime would be. Uh, of the people like, that know how to do it and can do it in like 12 minutes apart and the people that don't know how to do it and get stuck in there for three hours and quit. Uh, or the poor people which just got to the end of Temple 2 and just hit that Zugamoy fight even oh, on Oh, and then they die? Fight, oh. and, they just, and they just get like crushed by the difficulty spike at the end of that. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, it was, it's... It was some real challenging uh, content. Now, granted, um, I think I think now it's in a much better place. Uh, yep. I know that there's some stuff. Uh, if I get a chance, I'm going to hop in and do a little bit of work on the elemental nodes. I want to drop the uh, the monster population down a little bit. It's a little too high for my own taste. Um, mm. But otherwise, 
uh, I'm pretty happy uh, how we reworked that sort of stuff. I know uh, it is funny watching people play through the content. Like, I got a chance to watch you uh, play through the content, and we're for the first one, you're kind of like, I don't know why they added these runes to this first part. And I know that that's a little frustrating for people mm -hmm. and all that sort of stuff. But the way that I looked at it was, if I didn't add those, uh, the runtime of that first dungeon could have been about a minute and a half. Yeah, because you just straight up go to the end, yep. Yep, and uh, so uh, so when you when I was looking at that particular dungeon, I'm like, okay, so what do I do, and what's the method of of making this a little bit longer, which isn't horrifically onerous, and yeah. um, what types of uh, content can I sort of highlight? And stuff like that? I find it funny because I remember, yeah, I was I definitely had that question, but then of course, you know, there's at the beginning there's a note on the ground that just tells you literally what you're supposed to do. Yep. And I've seen people get stuck where they don't know what to do and they're wandering around the temple aimlessly and they have no idea where they're supposed to go, even with that there. Um, yep. Where is like the line that you would draw for kind of shoving somebody in the right direction by having instead of a note on the ground, that's the voiceover when the quest starts versus, um, you know, something else or like having like a guy that you talk to versus a note. Where, 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 do, you, where do you draw the line there? So it really depends on the piece of content and where we are in the development process. Um, one of the challenges that sometimes happens um, in mid to late, uh, in about like three quarters of the way through the development process, maybe a little bit early, maybe closer to two thirds, we have a voice dialogue lock on what we have. To do. And mm. so sometimes we don't have a chance to have our full play experience put together when we have to record voice dialogue. Right. So for, for me, I always like to have things voiced. Uh, if we can have voices, uh, kind of point things out as an extra uh, piece of thing. Uh, like, I, I think- There's a lot of that NPCs. in Slave Lords. Oh where, yeah, yeah. You know, Travis Willingham will just tell you about something that's going on, like the Magnet Room and other stuff. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and part of that was because there were more challenging concepts in that particular piece. And also when you're working on a classic dungeon, you have a little more, um, you need to be a little more careful about the original uh, text and being like at least somewhat faithful or at least putting enough connections to it so that people which are playing through, they're like, oh yeah, I remember this thing or I remember this piece. And so... Yeah, no, that uh, so, makes sense. It's like some of the like the, the bigger parts that people can remember being a part of the campaign. You actually wanted to have that kind of hit the hit the page and hit their ear. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um so yeah. Uh let's see. But yeah, no no, like for the most part uh it, it's kind of exciting like in the case of the uh the, the specific page. I mean, the feedback came through and I remember watching it and being like, "Yes, we need more additional feedback. Um, I put, like, I added dialogue to start with. I added uh, quest objectives. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, okay, we need a little bit more. How do we do this? And then at least I figured if I referenced the types of monsters or types of things or alluded to them, that players which had seen it before would at least have an idea. Or if they ran into, like, a harpy, they'd understand that that was perhaps the right place to yeah, I think that, well, I mean, you were also very, really, really receptive to feedback on like the first run that I did on the mini. I remember you were there and immediate yeah. changes were stuff like, oh, the rune is glowing now when you turn it off. So it's like very stand out on the wall so you can see it as opposed to the other way around. Um, yeah, and absolutely. Stuff like that. So um, like that dungeon evolved in a good way. I know something that a lot of people want, and I know you probably can't promise this, but yeah. uh, have you ever thought about, because there's a lot of people that miss the, the, uh, hard part of Zugget Moy, it was made a lot easier. Um, yep. Have you guys thought about making like just just like a one room Zugget Moy ultra fight because you have because you have it now separated in this whole dungeon that it's it's pretty much just the end fight now. Uh, so there are some challenges with doing that. Um, would I, would that be something that I would like to do if I was given a decent amount of time? Mm -hmm. Yes. And also, if I had some time with uh, Steelstar, who originally built the fight, um, because there's some sort of uh, exciting uh, scripting and programming which are behind that. 
Um, oh, true, because I imagine it probably has a lot of like custom stuff that went into it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, it has a ton of custom stuff, has a ton of custom animations, and a, a bunch of different pieces. Is it something that would be interesting to do at a point? Yes. Is it something that I see realistically us doing in the nearest future? Probably not, but you never know. You never know. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, especially when I, I just, that occurred to me that, yeah, it, you know, oh, let's make the fight, uh, let's do something harder and make it more expansive. But it was also made in 2015, 2014. So mm -hmm. the, the idea that the person who was responsible for it is not working on that never occurred to me. Uh, I keep forgetting yeah. that Dungeons and Dragons line is an old product that has changed hands uh, uh, many just times. Just a few times, a few times. Um, the oldest tenured, tenured person working on it currently, I believe, is Torque. Although one or two of the engineering folks at SSG um, working mostly on DDO are about uh, about that time. Yeah. Although Torque does a lot of things. He he doesn't do just like he does. He does the raids and he does programming yeah. and he does all this stuff. Torque is amazing. We were so lucky uh, when he came back to the team uh, following uh, right before when uh, Standing Stone Games broke apart. Yeah. Turbine and, uh, you know, wanted to run off uh, through uh, when we wanted to run off and, you know, start this uh, fun little company. Yeah, and then once you have them, of course, that's when you attach, like, the chain for the ball and chain so he can't get away. Uh, hopefully not. Hopefully he <laughs> enjoys his work. He he seems to dig it. Like, yeah. he has a... But, but he does have, like, an encyclopedic knowledge of a, a wide array of different things. And he has a, a lot of different balls in the air and a lot of responsibilities. And so... Uh, we try to do our very uh, best. Yes, a uh, portion of his job is to make our caniverse actually cry bitter salty tears. Well, uh, it has guys, been very funny to watch the journey of, of a man uh, being broken down. So that's been fun uh, for me. I I, I hope they get it. Uh, it's it's interesting for me. I've walked through some of it. Um, uh, I, I've been there for developer play days. I've actually played the raid while those folks were trying stuff. And uh, that's always an interesting uh, thing for me because uh, I sit there and uh, I just, you know, I do my DPS. I hit my buttons <laughs> and uh, that's about it. And I'm like, oh, God, please heal me. I, I, I only have like five half life uh, past lives on this character. And he is just melting every time people, uh, you know, with twice my hit points don't care about exploding different things. And, uh, you know, yeah, with exploding, the exploding skulls. curses. Yeah. 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 It's secrets. great when, well, yeah. 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 When, when people aren't really paying attention to the fact that you are wee bitty. And, uh, it was, uh, it was fun. Well, cause you're playing bow rogue right now, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, one of those builds that I know is very good and it does a lot of damage and I've seen your damage. It's very good. But like yep. the fact that it's like when your health goes down, it doesn't go up without someone helping you. I'm like, yeah, I can't do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, the answer is, do other folks know how that secret works? Yes. Do we know that it works? Yes. And do we know that it works on live? Yes. Um, uh, Twerk himself has playtested it on a server in uh, using uh, essentially admin stuff on a live server and knows that it is uh, functioning correctly. Yeah. So the the answer is just kind of get smarter, guys. This, it, this uh, reminds me of... Uh, a lot of like because the the secret <clears throat> i don't know any of it i have done none of the research so i am i am currently just throwing rocks from my glass house where like mm -hmm. i'm aware that i have no idea what's going on but it's funny it reminds me of there was the curse for the keeper of the crimson covenant dagger and mm -hmm. uh there's that secret where the secret was you had to um take this dagger put on a vol paladin and then it told you about Spe or specifically Vol, and then take it into the raid and go into the cloud and it upgrades when you're holding it. Um, and that took over a month for the community to figure out because they tried everything except for going into the raid with Vol in it. Yep. And uh, sometimes honestly, it doesn't I'm, come to your mind. Yeah, no, no. And, and one of the challenges is like when you're designing and when you're building that sort of stuff, what is understandable for players? What can they look at and... Uh, what pieces do they take? Are they spiraling outwards? Are they paying attention to the types of things that they're supposed to be? Yep. Now, I can't give any particular uh, hints or anything like that. Um, anyone involved in that, I'm sure Torque is thinking about that and you know working on it. And I'm looking forward to sort of the next 
uh, piece. And when people figure it out, I'm super excited. Um, but uh, yeah, I think um, he... I, and 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 also it isn't a necessarily a get good thing that I know a lot of your, uh, your 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 chat people are doing. It's there are moving pieces. There are things that you have to figure out, and people have started to figure out and you know work on and. Uh, if, if, if you think it's that simple, then, um, then you should show him how easy it is and, 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 and do it before he does. Yeah. I'm, I'm too dumb for that. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna wait until eventually, like I'm the type of player that when a, a secret is put out in front of me and then the developer is like, yes, you can do it. You can do it. And then I'm just sitting there stuck with like this square peg trying to fit it in the round hole. And then I just get, I just give up and then like, <sighs> and they make a square hole and then I'm like, all right, perfect. Um, uh, I just want to figure out the secret by killing the boss. Is that does that not work? I can't just kill the boss it, and I figure out the secret. Hey, listen, there's a lot of good loot on that car, that that monster. You know, just kill it. It's very neat. Um, yeah, excited. exactly. Uh, I'm excited to see people uh, get through that. Um, mm. I think it'll be fun when it happens. Um, and yeah, you know, a lot of that stuff is is super exciting. You know, uh, I was gonna ask because obviously we talked about some of the different content designers, so. Obviously, SSG, you know, has in the past and is probably still currently, I, I haven't checked, is like, you know, hiring people to do work and stuff. When somebody yep. gets started being a content designer, what do you, obviously, I don't, I don't think you're part of the hiring process, but what do you Stanislaw okay. Games look for in terms of like new content designers? What are like some good skill sets for like a content designer? Um, so am I a part of the hiring process? Yes. I'm not at the, like the, 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 like front front end but i do okay. a lot of the uh i do a lot of interviews and uh when we look through uh you know uh when we go through like passes of of different uh resumes that have been passed down and things of that sort um so what do we what do we like to see um the things so it's different for ev from everybody um right. what i like to see is um, to start with, uh, sort of what your background is and what you have knowledge of. Um, right now is a time in gaming and in video games where you have access to a wide array of different tools. Um, if you're someone who doesn't work in the industry um, and isn't familiar with most of the um, uh, any tools, um, if you're interested in doing some basic stuff, learn the basics of those tools uh make something in unreal make something in unity yeah because those if, engines are free you can literally just download them and play around yeah absolutely and uh and and put that stuff together now if you're a person which plays uh, things that i like i like people which are active uh mmo players i like people which are specifically um i i love to see when people have played ddo or have an understanding of ddo mm -hmm. uh, it isn't particularly necessary but having an understanding of dungeons and dragons as sort of an overarching concept is something that I find really important. And also, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry. Oh, good. I'm getting over a sinus infection and some stuff. Um, me too. Wow. Uh, twinsies. Yeah. Yeah. I took um, so much day quill before this. I my whole uh, weekend. I was like racked with a sinus infection. Uh, last, uh, last week I couldn't wear headphones because, uh, because the pressure built up in my ears so much. It was awful. Um, yeah. but anyway, uh, I had to go back to it. Um, one of the things that I always like to ask when uh, when we actually get to interview and talk to people, um, one of the skills that I want people to have is I find when people are giving critiques and looking at things that it's very easy to pick apart and tell me what you don't like about something, but I find it much more interesting to show me what you like and what you love. And also if it's something that wasn't a style or something that you're interested or like a piece of content that you really really didn't enjoy what's that one thing that you did enjoy how can mm -hmm. you actually look through when you're actually looking into that like how like what's the positive piece of that and what would you take from that to build your next thing or what's the method that you would uh how would you give that specific feedback because i mean honestly right now we live in a time when people are relentlessly and and uh relentlessly negative and um oh yeah the process happened so to, fast to say mean hurtful and dismissive and crappy things about something 
it's perfectly fine to have criticism. Criticism is an important portion of it. But the oh, way yeah. that people um, go about and are are hurtful and dismissive and attacking, um, the most important thing that you can ever do is build. Like if you build, if you create, if you're someone who wants to create, those types of things are things that I look at when I see a designer and when I see it, I'm like, you, I want you because you have this want. You will want... You have this want to build you want to build cooperatively you want to build and work with other people um but an ability to tell me that something is shit i that that yeah. takes that, that that takes two seconds and no long-term thought yeah, exactly yeah, if, if i want to hear if i want to hear about something like that i'll just go to reddit you know <laughs> like i like and i understand that you know people have rough days people have rough times they're going through a lot of different stuff and so sometimes they need to vent, they need to go through that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. But like, what I want is if you're, what's your, if you're giving criticism, what are the positive points of criticism? What are the points where you say, I liked this, this could be better, but this is why I think it could be better. Mm -hmm. the, the why is the most important portion. And um, this, this dismissiveness and not thinking of how other people work is, uh, is, is super important yeah what someone said was a uh, compliment sandwich like yeah well and i think it's also too because like the discussion has to be so important because i imagine you guys you work you work create cooperatively on a team and so you yeah. might be working on something and it's it's one thing for somebody like imagine you see somebody who's working on another dungeon and you yep. see something that that is out of place there's like a fight that just doesn't look good or doesn't feel good you could say this fight's bad this fight's shit or whatever or you could say you know I like the fight. How do you feel about doing this to add on to it? Or like or, an idea to make it better or like, or just, you know, trying to figure out like se separating the good parts from the bad parts and being able to make sure the criticism lands in a way that is some easy for somebody to take in. Uh, and also presenting stuff as uh, what's the problem to solve or what were you, what were your initial wants to do this? And mm -hmm. um, what are ways that we can accomplish that? Uh, which may not be being accomplished in this particular manner or um, and it and it's tough and I mean one of the interesting and challenging things about being a person who works on DDO is that the content designers have different wants and interests in the game and our player base has a pretty wide amount of interests Oh yeah, people like like there are quests that I don't like that some people absolutely love across the board because yep. of how varied the quest system is. Yeah, absolutely. Like um, like I know that you are a huge fan of Amber Temple. I love Amber like, Temple. What a great quest! I that is not my favorite quest. Uh, so good. I think that there were things that were done, and I agree with some parts. I don't disagree. I don't agree with some parts. Um. I find that if you're a player going into it, uh, it can be really challenging. Uh, it can be something that prevents people from actually finishing the Raven, uh, the Ravenloft uh, like experience as a whole, uh, because it's uh, required content to go through it. Um, especially oh, yeah. if you don't sort of grok what's happening. Now, I, I've taken my time and uh, I, I've run through on a couple of stream runs. Um, as a note, I do occasionally play with Strom Tom. I'm lucky enough to get a chance to do it. When I have some free time, I hop in. I'm, uh, I'm well, and also of... like full disclosure, you're in my guild on Argon Essence. So, oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm in, in your guild. Um, one of my buddies came along and I'm leveling up some stuff over there. Yeah. Um, but like it's uh, it's tough. And and, and one of the things, and one of the interesting things about making uh, dungeons is sometimes you want to try a mechanic, and sometimes successful sometimes it's not not as successful as you want it to be but you have an idea and your want and your want to push for that is also important because you're pushing mm. the game forward as you try it like yeah let's well, say go uh, ahead. just gonna say if you obviously yeah not every mechanic is going to work but that's one that's how you learn is by making things that sometimes also don't work or don't hit exactly the same way uh, but at the end of the day i mean the dungeon's still there so you can move forward yeah. from that. Maybe you go back and adjust it later, but if the Amber Temple, something about Amber Temple didn't land perfectly, I mean, Amber Temple is still there. So now next time, okay, we know for next time, do it something different in a different way. Yeah. Uh, and how can you learn and how can you look at other resources if that is a point of pain for you to bypass it? You know? Yeah. 
I mean, I I will admit <clears throat> that there are a couple of reasons why I personally think Amber Temple is a great quest. Um, mm -hmm. One is that they're as random as it seems because there's, I think, 11 different versions of the temple. There's yep. only 11 different versions. So once you learn which version is which, it makes it easier to figure out. But I have heavy nostalgia from on the first day of Ravenloft's release. There was a bug that caused one of the actual amber statues uh, to enable PvP flagging. Oh, uh, yeah. Yep. I, actually, I don't I, think it was a bug. I think it was like it was put in the game and whoever designed it didn't realize how horrible of an idea that was. Uh, and it was mm -hmm. so fun because the second we figured that out, everyone started team killing each other um, and it made an awesome quest. Uh, and uh, that that got that got hot fixed like that week. But uh, man, that I was, was fun. I was in your group on that day, and yeah. I was playing a archer with uh, improved precise shot. And getting a, um, I got obliterated so many times. And there were one or two times, like before we figured out what was happening, because these were really capable characters which were just falling over, and it was just like I'd be like, "Aha!" Improved precise shot, many shot, and then like two people would fall over dead. I'm like, I don't know what's going on. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. So maybe um, not the best, maybe not the best quest for everybody, but because of that nostalgia, I'll always enjoy it as like an adventure. No, um, no, absolutely. And I mean, that story is one that I love to tell to this very day. Like, it's good times. And um, for me, what it is, is I like the concept of doing randomization, but I think something like um, uh, the castle quest uh, in the same Ravenloft chain mm. is randomization in a more effective manner and does a better job of uh, of vectoring you towards what it is while doing a similar type of thing. Yeah, because it, it tells you where to go, but not <clears throat> exactly what to do. So at least you yep. have a direction. Um, I did actually have a question with regards to something else. I just wanted to also point out that because we were talking about like experiences and how that shapes everything, even mm -hmm. though I might like I don't, I didn't like Old Temple of Elemental Evil. I don't really like Slave Lords. They're just, they're kind of, they're really, really long. Yep. But it's not that I don't like them at all. I liked the first time I went through all of them. The first time through mm -hmm. Temple of Elemental Evil was like four hours. And I remember every minute of that experience. The first time through Slave Lords, and then you're halfway through, and then there's that bear roaring at you. Yep, or the yep. first time with the final fight. Um, I loved it. I had a great time. Um, and I guess that's kind of the contrast. You build these really strong experiences. Mm -hmm. But then you don't want to go back to them, um, which is kind of hard in a game about repetition. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's one of those things is that as time allows, you know, it's uh, it's looking at those dungeons and seeing if we have time in our schedule to take someone's uh, a little bit of time or a decent amount of time. Like uh, Temple was an undertaking for us to redo to the point. I mean, it was three or four different people uh, mm -hmm. spent a, a decent amount of time. Uh, uh, I'm thinking about it. Linabel, uh, and Torque and I were the three people which did most of the work, but yeah. uh, knocked back, and one or two other people did some stuff when we were coming through. And uh, you know, it's uh, uh, it's uh, I was happy with how that redo went, and it's a good template for what we need to do. Oh, it's but great. I still think. But the I number of people who I've seen personally just tell me like I could never do Temple that before, and now I've done it like once or twice, and it's way better uh, yeah, that they can go through I, it. I now do it every TR. It's great. I'm actually really enjoying Temple. Okay, that makes me very happy. And uh, going back to the bear, um, uh, it's a long dungeon, but I am very happy how the bear came out. That was one of my favorite things that I did for that. Uh, it's the gravity trap and the bear. Those were my two when I read through the module, and I'm like. I can't wait to do this. Yeah, you got to you got to put them in. Yeah, yeah. And uh the the note from Knockback when uh, he was doing the VO session with Travis Willingham and uh he looked uh like and they were doing it on his Skype and uh and he got to the line and just did this huge guttural bear roar and they're like, "Well, that was awesome, but that's not what we need. We need yep. the most disimpassioned fake someone saying roar that you could possibly give and uh he crushed it. absolutely crushed it. it's a great it's it is a you can tell it like it really sounds like somebody was phoning it in yeah 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 um i did actually have a question and this so this is a kind of a broader design question but i think you might be able to field this so mm -hmm. optionals are a thing in ddo but they're yeah. also like a polarizing thing 
Um, mm -hmm. Some people think optionals should give more XP, so you you know you get heavily rewarded for doing them. But then uh, the optionals sort of don't become optional anymore because mm -hmm. now you have to do them. How do you feel about like kind of the current state of optionals in the game, and how do you guys internally think of optionals? How do you kind of plan them? Um, so the state of optionals right now are. I like, in many cases, some of the things that we're doing with them. I think that I understand that there is a frustration that some people are like, oh, I must do this thing or this thing. I think it's sometimes best served when we do things like this is an extra wing or something like that to a dungeon. Um, I think that that is a great time to do optionals. Um, hmm. I do like that... Part of the thing about optionals, though, is that it allows us to reward different gameplay. Like, are you doing more exploratory work than someone who's just trying to run through as quickly as possible? Um, mm -hmm. Is there a way that we can reward that? Um, so do I think... I don't know. I'm pretty happy with how it's going, but I understand that there are places where it, it could be done better. Um, I think that... When you go into an, something like another wing, that we need to make sure that that uh, gives enough XP so that it is functional enough that your amount and time investment is worth that amount of time. And I think that that balance is something that we hit on and sometimes we miss on. Um, I think that the design of optionals, part of the challenge as a designer when you're going through optionals is... Mm -hmm. Uh, the type of content that you're putting together for it, like, is this just an extra orange name boss with an extra chest? Uh, or is this an actual slightly different experience? And making sure that those reward differently, I think, is important. So, it, I mean, like, it's interesting because when I think about how the optionals kind of shake up in quests, I think you're right. A lot of times it does end up being like, here is a door that will go somewhere with, like, a named monster and that's very different with a chest and that's very different from an optional of here is a puzzle you can solve or here mm -hmm. is um or an alternate way to handle an adventure i feel like um they're different i mean from my perspective i actually don't super care about the numbers reward from optionals i more care mm -hmm. about the contextual reward i prefer optionals that give me more story about quests so for example like I'm going to bring it back to Amber Temple again. But the Amber Temple yep. optional is cool because it adds to the story of Ravenloft. It gives you context about these different these different cursed beings and stuff, and they all have their own story. Or optionals where you have to collect notes in a quest because that gives you like the details about what's going on and allows you to fill that in. Um, and I really wouldn't want to see the optionals being the optimal path because mm -hmm. they're then they're not optionals anymore. Now it's it's the XP and more so the, explorer, it's the exploratory nature of Dungeons and Dragons. Mm-hmm. No, that makes perfect sense. No, no, no. I, and 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 for the most part, I agree. I mean, one of the challenges is that sometimes optionals get a little shortchanged when we're in the process of the design phase, but we've done some really neat stuff with it. And I think that it's also really good for what can we do which is not primary path that rewards characters with different builds or different concepts, like... Can we do a heavy trap corridor or something like that? Because um, as a team, we've moved away from if this is in the primary path, um, these must be dodgeable or avoidable traps in some way, shape, or form. But now we can put in a hallway that is full of traps and completely rewards, uh, you know, a, a rogue and their experience and their optional and also uh, their trap, de uh, the, 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 you know, the, the, the trap solving portion of mm -hmm. it and also the xp bonuses for it i'm sorry i forgot all right now <laughs> yeah it's all I'm good a little tired. Um, um but yeah like it's it, it's tough but it's a tool that we have and it's probably a tool that we could use more effectively from time to time but it's just a question of uh, uh of time that we spend while we're doing that and um being efficient in in our time in building dungeons. yeah i mean i imagine optionals probably are the things that get cut the most where it's like you're designing the dungeon and if you have to if you know it's got to go out you're on a time crunch to finish this thing the optionals are where they some of the detail gets lost versus the main meat of the quest 
Yeah, absolutely. Or this is the, you know, I wanted to do this whole optional thing. I had this great idea. Um, uh, I did this kind of convoluted mechanic, which I don't want to push players through unless they really want to check it out. Uh, and then it's, uh, and then you're like, well, this is going to fall on the floor. Um, like, to give you an idea, there are seven or eight corridors that got closed off in Slavers 2. Oh, yeah, there's tons still... of doors you can't open. There's a couple ones oh. that have keys, or like there was one at the beginning, there was a door that was locked, and you said you needed a key, and you couldn't get through it. Another one that had a key, but had nowhere to go, because it, oh, yeah, it was pretty yeah, obvious yeah. that they got locked off. Uh, and the answer is that, you know, we were doing run rates uh, and run speed of it, and uh, I locked off about a third of that dungeon. Yep. I, I actually removed a third of the dungeon and removed about a third of the packs, and it still runs that long. Like, uh, and uh, why does there still need to be a time crunch when things will be finished? Because that's the nature of building things. That's like, business. Yeah, like, it's, it's one of those things is, like, there's a... Um, there are times that we need to release content. Uh, there's, uh, you know, to keep players engaged, keep players interested. Um, and while there's some small uh, time and space for, for movement, it, it's also, there are times as me as a designer, I get lost in the, like I, I get fixated on this puzzle that I want to make, which is super cool and this sort of stuff. And then a week goes by and I'm like, I could have done two thirds of the other things that I need to do for this, 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 this portion of the dungeon or I could have done mm -hmm. this and this and this and this or if I had just finished the dungeon rather than putting down this overly complex thing I could do it but that's also a portion of the creative process like there are yeah. things that die on the floor uh, there are things that I just remove that that they don't uh, you know that don't go through that sort of stuff like it's uh, and for me I I work better under stricter uh, guidelines and under better and smaller. Uh, yeah, because then you know exactly how much time you can devote to something versus being yeah. open ended, where you're like, I could devote a bunch of time to something and then realize you your time would have been better spent working on something else without having that push yeah. to figure that out. Um, um, you touched on something I thought was interesting when it comes to optional content, which is traps. Uh, I yep. love traps. Traps are awesome in Dungeons and Dragons Online. So one of my favorite parts about this game is that somebody installs it and they're used to playing World of Warcraft or Lord of the Rings or something where you can basically just press the first button on the keyboard and you'll beat almost every monster in the game. And then you join DDO and you can click the mouse and beat almost every monster in the game except for one monster called the trap that beats you every time. Uh, yep. But except the more modern quest design, the number of traps has gone down per quest. Most traps or most quests have zero traps now. Um, and if they do have traps, it's usually a trapped optional chest or a trapped other thing. Um, where's all the traps, man? What happened? It used to be like every quest would have like two blade traps, a poison trap, a sonic trap, an exploding box. So some of that has to do with a shift in design philosophy. Uh, some of it has to do with the fact that um, our current content team doesn't believe that you should need a player to disarm track traps to get through the main playable content flow of a dungeon. Um, it's some things that uh, any group can uh, participate and go through it. It's it's a shift, and I know that that's different than things that we did way back when and all of that sort of stuff. It's just a philosophy of what we're doing. Like any trap that we put in primary path, there needs to be a way to avoid it uh, gameplay for it, uh, dodging and all of that sort of mm -hmm. stuff. Also, um, some of the people who previously worked on the uh, on the the product were a little bit better about how do I make this trap dodgeable through like moving through and making sure that like this is a I stand here the trap goes off I stand here goes that trap. That, yeah, like having timings stuff. or a way to get around. Yeah, traps. yeah, and yeah. and that stuff is really fiddly and takes a lot of time. And um, through some of the stuff in game, isn't as reliable as we want to, mm -hmm. um, and so it's a little frustrating. But the answer is that there are times that we definitely need to do more trap stuff, um, and it's just something that we need to be a little more attentive. Yeah, I mean, I like the way it was done in <clears throat> in Isle of Dread, where for the most part, any of the traps you encountered were like very natural traps. Like yep. there's a bear trap, and you can see the bear trap. So it's like, you know, you stepped in it. 
for Bullywugs and Booby Traps, you knew there was going to be traps because it was in the title of the quest. Yep. Um, do you think yeah. that, you know, because it is a big shift from early DDO where like pretty mm -hmm. much every Harbor and Marketplace quest has one to two traps in them mm -hmm. that you guys would like go back and do some trap cutting or trap adjusting? Or is that more likely to be something like you know, there will be like a uh, an eventual revamp of, of early game content. And so that would happen then. So. So there's multiple different pieces of this. In my opinion, there are a couple of traps scattered around the game um, that probably are a little too harsh for what they do at the time that they do. Um, uh, there's the one... Uh, trap that hits you with all the different elements i think it's somewhere in giant hold oh it yeah kills, like, that's the one in the it, hallway in um, it, foundation of discord where you walk through the it, hallway and then it and and it, i think it's dies. randomized and it's not always there that it's quest, not always there yeah, but that quest also has another trap which is secret door and then you go open the secret door it's just a trap it just kills you <clears> yep, it doesn't yep, then yep, you can't nope, disable nope. it i love uh, that's I, my favorite trap watching people uh, die to that is so satisfying uh i love that trap but that other one, not my favorite, not yeah. my 100% favorite. So it's one of those things is that it's sort of a, a balance. I think it's one of those things that it is something that sets DDO apart. And so we have to be more judicious about our use for them and also making sure that they're uh, an aspect of gameplay as you go through. Mm -hmm. I think, <clears throat> me personally, I think that, um, that the dungeons in... Isle of Dread did a better job of being like, there's two or three different uh, quests with specific traps uh, that made them interesting and avoidable and uh, were a good portion of gameplay. But I also think that we need to embrace that a little bit more, but I think that might be done more in sort of optional pathways or things like that. Like if I make a hallway that skips six packs, but has three traps, is that worth time wise for players to do, or is that something that people are interested in doing? I think that that's yeah. something that we could do. I mean, the other part too is also like just frequency and how fun it is. Like every yeah. once in a while, when you see a trap, it's like, oh, there is a trap. But when every quest has loads of traps, um, you know, yeah. you kind of just like, oh, another trap. Uh, and I mean, right now, one of the challenges that we have, and it's something that the system team's looking at, and hopefully they'll be doing a fix, is. Um, our higher end, our super high end traps right now, you have to be a very specific build and builds to be able to be a trapper at the highest stuff at the highest difficulty. And yeah. uh, some of and and that is not intentional, or that that was intentional, but it's something that I'm hoping that we're going to ratchet down, uh, because I don't think that I think that people which put a decent amount of skills and have an item they shouldn't need to itemize every single point to be able to do standard traps and dungeons. Yeah. Well, it's also, it's like such a mixed bag because you have yeah. some skills that require like 60. So like in the raid, I think it's um, Dryden the Demigod to bluff the giant. You need like an 80 or something on your bluff, but to disable yep. a trap in Feywild, you need like 106 to disable the vice on elite, but to intimidate yep. the boss in Dryden the Demigod, you need like 130, I think for the intimidate. Yep. So the skills are kind of all over the place. And I also think it goes hand in hand with both like the design of the thing and also the itemization, because um, from where I stand, we have like right now, the game is level 32. We have between yep. level 29 and 31, something like 400 items, but there's yep. no insightful skills items of the whole 400. So even if a player wanted to increase their skill, uh, their options are do shroud end of sentence. Um, yep. And and, so, and and best of luck fitting that into your item set, by the way. Yeah. And then or just use a swap, which is not what everybody wants to do. Um, I know. So I think I think that like, yeah, having some adjustments <clears throat> there is, would probably be. Yeah. Um, you know, but it's, it's a, a multi-pronged approach, though, I think, you know. Yeah. Uh, and I agree with Intimidate. And also um, for me, this is my pet peeve. Um, I play a bear tank. Uh, I'm playing a, a poison bear tank because it's a poison bear. And uh, it's fun to play. It's fun to play. Um, uh, one of the challenges uh, that I do have is that um, that intimidate doesn't work on a wide array of different monsters and all that sort of stuff. 
Yeah. And, uh, it's, maybe... it's very jarring to go from like another MMO where yeah. like tank press taunt and then monster is taunted and you come to DDO and you press taunt and like skeletons don't notice, zombies don't notice, lots of animals don't notice and you're like, oh yeah. Um, And, uh, and I think that uh, a lessening of that and a working through that and you know, there's some challenges with it, but um, I'm really hoping that some of that stuff gets fixed up. I mean, there's entire uh, expansions where you're like, Half of the monsters in this entire expansion, I can't taunt. And you're yep. just like... That's Ravenloft. Uh, and Feywild? Uh, Probably. Feywild's not too... Uh, yeah, Feywild has a yeah, lot of yeah, them. Yeah, you, the animated you get, armors, you the, the vermin. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the plants, beetles, all of that the, sort of oh, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah like, mm. it's it's something that... Um, that I'll just say is at least on our, ra our, uh, on our radar. Yeah. I was going to say also um, from not so much about like the intimidation and the skills, but also just generally with like some of the low level content, especially around like Salt Marsh and we've gotten Salt Marsh, we've got Isle of Dread. Uh, one of the second problem, because we we're talking about traps, is that, you know, obviously traps can be a pain for some players and so they're not in every quest. But also, uh, I think probably now more than ever, people are soloing, I would argue, yep. most likely, because like the as time's gone on, players got more powerful, there's better potions, you've got hirelings, you've got all these things you don't need to play with others. And whenever I talk about how to be good in Hardcore League, people come back with, yeah, but I'm a solo player. And I'm like, oh, that sucks. Anyway, here's what you do with your group. Um, and it's just a tough scenario. Do you guys think about the solo player when you design new quests? Or do you guys kind of design the quest with the party in mind? Like, where does that, you know, how do you design from there? Uh, for the most part, um, we like to keep groups in mind, and we're we try to do a decent amount of paying attention to groups and how they play. But a lot of our interim, like solo play, t like a lot of our playtest stuff, is done solo. Um, now, some of it's not specifically minded for challenge, but some of it is. Mm. Um, so we do keep an attention of it, but. Um, <sighs> like even you yourself when you're like designing a dungeon do you think about like okay thank you if i if somebody solos this they'll this is how this would feel versus a group or or does that not go through uh yeah yeah no no, no that goes through it, it's essentially like how many monsters do am i spawning per pod for this what's a fair fight like if i do something in which there's a you know orange name add on top of this red Will that just absolutely crush a solo player, or do they have options or things that they can do? But um, um, but it's something that we have to be, you know, careful and considered out. But you know, sometimes you know, sometimes we miss. Sometimes it doesn't work as well. But a lot of our initial playtest stuff is done solo. So um, I don't like. I think larger encounters or more complex encounters, we really consider multiple players but there has to be a method to do something which is soloable mm -hmm. so w like designing designing encounter wise we think of the solo player because we want everything to be solo bull however sometimes i don't know if monster wise we do as good of a job balancing for if you are just one player going through this experience yeah, because I, I know that that is a problem for a lot of players. Like, Salt Marsh is, I'm going to use this as a poster child. I like Salt Marsh. I think the content is good. But if you are by yourself and you're not playing an AoE class, heaven forbid you're playing a single weapon fighter or a two weapon fighter, each pack of monsters has is like 8 to 10 when you're playing by yourself. Each one has like tons of hit points and you just chop, chop, chop. And you can do it in a lot of cases, but you're taking a lot of hits. Uh, it takes forever. Um... And I know that I know that in um, Isle of Dread there was a, a focus, a bigger focus on like bigger monsters, so you'd have like yep. fewer monsters per pack. But then the dinosaurs kind of stole the show, um, and I really liked that. I thought that was good in terms of the the design there. Um, yeah, the, one of the challenges is is that I think that some of the monster scaling for smaller group sizes for number of players is more reliant on players playing easier difficulty. And it I is, don't, yeah. 
and it's I like don't normal think... hard and elite have different numbers of monsters, but the yep. players in the adventure mm -hmm. determine how much health they have. Yeah, and so, uh, and also class does, and a number of other things because there's there's some waiting stuff which is a little wacky. Yeah. Um, um, but it is something that we should consider and take a look at because having that be a rewarding experience. Also, there's a um. In a perfect world, we would rather people play with other people um, because that community aspect and and doing that is is something that we like to encourage and we like to have. But we understand that the reality of it is that a lot of times folks don't have other people to play with. The other mm -hmm. people they play with aren't around and all of that sort of stuff. Yeah. But um, that's that's worth considering and taking a look at. Um, separate note. You've played you played other MMOs, yeah? Yeah. You know, your World of Warcraft or SWOTOR or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and I worked on a couple other ones. Yeah, so something I am uh, curious about with DDO is a lot of these games will have, like... I can think of, like, World of Warcraft. They have, like, the prestige of, you know, every time the new raid comes out, it's the mythic race where people got to go the fastest to get the content and stuff. Yep. Um, and DDO doesn't really have, like, like kind of hard mode either encouragement from development staff or even the players are pretty apathetic as well yep there's there's there are certain groups of people that are very heavily focused about that mm -hmm. but the majority of players couldn't be bothered um yep. so how do you feel about that kind of like you know either like the ultra hard or things like a tied to like achievements with relating to ddo because i'm assuming you've probably experienced some of that you know in your time in mmos with the games so i I personally like that, and I like that as an experiential and as a as something for players to shoot towards. Um, it's something I would like to see more of, but it isn't something that, um, given sort of the 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 structure and sort of the um, uh, the amount of work that we have ongoing, that really put a great deal of time in it. If that makes sense, like yeah, it's, for sure, it's it, it's something. I think it would be great to see, you know, world first Reaper ten on the new raid, and be able to give, you know, the first server completion of a raid at a oh, certain difficulty. Or that'd be that, cool. honestly, like imagine if in we, the Hall of Heroes, <clears throat> there's like a plaque for each raid, but it was just based yep. on the servers, so like the first group to get <clears throat> it. Yep, but. But of course, part of the challenge with that is that that does have a cost. Like any yeah, oh yeah, you, you have that to... sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, because what that ends up with is that requires a lot of intervention from uh, from us as a design and as a staff having an understanding. Because our players are very creative and thoughtful people, which sometimes find alternative methods to solve problems which are not intended and are damaging in certain ways. That is the um, most diplomatic way I've ever heard anybody say that. Good job. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the, the thing is that finding those people doing those things does take a certain amount of time and effort. Now, granted, there are people which flat out do exploits and they do things which will, will get them removed from the game. But like, Creative content solutions, which are borderline, are sometimes more challenging to be specifically judged by people which are less familiar with the content. And, yeah. um, and that additional a level of watching is is challenging. It's, yeah, it's, it, it's it, not it, no work. You have to figure it yeah, out. Yeah. You have to be like, and okay, so, so here's the YouTube video. Uh, and now you got to watch it and figure out what's going on. And you'd be like, okay, did they get to go on the wall? And that's, you know... And then not only yeah. like yeah, there's the manual input and the review, yeah, uh, and and all of that stuff. But I mean, honestly, we do a little bit of that with hardcore, and um, uh, and, and that's kind of okay, you know. Uh, every once in a while, you get names which aren't great, or you know, all of that sort of stuff. But uh, that one happens too on hardcore league, uh, yeah. That I remember that yeah. for like hardcore five, there's like a bunch of names that got removed. Yep, yep. Um, but. Yeah, no, uh, it, it was just something I I thought about because just even generally, um, you know, I I feel like DDO would be a cool game to have like an achievement system for, 
because oh. imagine yeah, as, as a designer, you could just be like, you uh, know, you know, an achievement for different types of characters or classes, all sorts of stuff, <clears throat> the way to do that, dungeons. Uh, that is, that's on my list of yeah. things that I would love to see for DDO. I think an achievement says, system and a title system would be great. Um, uh, there's a content cost to it, and there's a whole bunch oh, yeah. of stuff. You got to get uh, somebody to do the work. Great. Yeah, and and there's a whole bunch of pieces to it. But the thing that I love about it is that it gives non power rewards to players who do extraordinary things, and I think that that is good in the ecosystem. Yeah, like uh, like I I just think that that is a real win. Like uh, I could put in a very complicated thing, and um, if you actually can do this this super insane puzzle over this thing, I can give you a title, and I don't have to worry about you spending a half hour on it. Now you have a a fancy title, or you know a jaunty hat, or whatever. Yeah, it's kind of like it would be so cool if there was magic, and you could just choose things from other games like even like lord of the rings and be like magic we have a title yep. system magic <laughs> oh yeah yeah absolutely and it's one of those things for me um figuring those things out uh it it's tough like someone was like hey what was the one thing that you would take if you could take from any other game um uh, that's a great question for, why did i think of that um for for it was one of the things on twitter i i do i, I pay attention to a lot of uh uh, game developers on Twitter because it's fun to see what other people are doing. Um, for me, it's um, cross-server faction and uh, scalable raid size from WoW. That oh the, yeah, like that like that trifecta of uh, of uh, accessibility uh, and uh, ability to form groups is would be. My pie in the sky thing that probably will never happen. I mean, it's but, a complicated subject, right? Because yeah. you know, I, for me, and I, I'm somebody who I'm not an old man on the outside, but I'm an old man on the inside, and I've played mm -hmm. a lot of these older games that were very exclusive. Like, yep. there's reasons why you know EverQuest is not the most popular game is because it's mm -hmm. time consuming and it's exclusive, and not everybody can do it. Um, whereas a game like World of Warcraft. Like anybody can do it. You can install it on almost any computer. Um, and now you can play with pretty much anybody at any time, which is nice. Yep. And uh, um, those types of things. A smart move. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh. I still remember, I think it was um, in Elder Scrolls, they had the standard like regular leveling system when the game first came out. So you leveled up to better in 16 or whatever it was. And then they go, by the way, we're rescaling the entire video game. Anybody can play with anybody at any moment. And I was like, not skeptical, but I was just like, I don't know how this is going to be good. Maybe it's good. Maybe it's bad. And then you realize, oh, no, you can just literally always play with every other player forever. And there's always people around to do every bit of content. There's people doing new stuff, old stuff. And it was like, I just blew my mind how great of a system that was just to be able oh, yeah. to play with anybody. And the same thing in WoW, finding out that your friend is plays World of Warcraft. And you're like, oh, cool. And then their alliance and your horde, so you can't play. And it's ugh. it's it's so frustrating. Yeah, it's so frustrating. But um. Uh, but yeah, no, 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 like a, a sidekick system going back from Old City of Heroes, that would be fantastic. That would be, be a good to idea see. too. Um, I think some of them are more achievable. Like I think I think a title system is something that could be more achievable and hopefully, you know, finds its way on a schedule. Um, I think that sidekicking is something that would be really interesting in DDO. Um, yeah. See if something like that... Um, uh, well, that sort of stuff is complicated too because like level means a lot more i think in D, &D than it does in other contexts like yep. in terms of lord of the rings online level doesn't really mean anything not just mm -hmm. because they don't have that in the world but also like your orcs are your antagonist the whole way through so whether you're level 10 or level 110 you're still fighting orcs whereas in dungeons and dragons there's kind of that scale that like the higher level you get now you're fighting dragons and demigods and all these things is your higher level um and so just futzing around with people's levels and letting them do whatever would be a little bit more complicated i imagine for even from yeah. the storytelling perspective yeah it'd be more challenging but less so uh story-wise i think systems wise there's a whole bunch of different hurdles but it'd be interesting um the thing uh 
Um, the thing that someone mentioned, the other thing that I would give one of my appendages for is if we uh, opened up the UI and did stuff, did it mm. so, and had a lot more program, you know, essentially having a whole bunch of stuff which was uh, so that players could build add-ons and all of that sort of stuff, which we have a little bit over in Lotro, and I think uh, that sort of stuff. Yeah, like it's full, really helpful. It's really great. Yeah, full scripting um, and other stuff within the game. Oh yeah, I, I would, I, I would, I would give appendages if we would move in that direction. And uh, I don't know if it'll ever happen, but uh, it is a deep, deep want. Jeez, can't you guys just spend like millions of dollars on engineers to get this done? <laughs> it's just Technic, it, it's technically, technically, it, someone might, but I don't know if we will. But it's, I always find it, it's just one of those things that's funny. When um when you talk about like a company that you know obviously you guys have quite a few staff working on DDO and and also this probably a friggin' army working on Lord of the Rings, um so uh, not not particularly the smaller studio, but it's the you know when, I I always find it interesting when people who ask like how how come this thing hasn't been done it's like well because it costs millions of dollars yeah yeah like with and, an app um, uh, and uh, and also. Hiring people which are capable of doing that type of work w in this framework. Oh, true. Because you'd be well, hiring like, people who like don't know. It's like, yeah. By the way, this is from b before you started school. Uh, uh, and and also finding the right people to do that sort of work. Like finding an amazing engineer is like finding a unicorn. Finding a, you know, that the, there are like six or seven different places which are uh, which are real real rough to find, and um, you know that's sort of in the cross section of stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, some of the other projects I worked on, I, I was lucky enough to have people which did a lot of that sort of stuff. And some of those folks were freaking wizards. Yeah. Uh, the folks, the folks over on Wildstar, uh, they had a, a rock star UI team, which just had a lot of different understandings of that whole thing and really opened it up uh, and did, did a great job. Did a great job. Um, well, I'm, I'm, uh, but 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 going back to it to give you an idea, like for Lord of the Rings, um, uh, uh, when I was working on Wildstar, there were a hundred and ten content developers working on content that project. Content developers, damn. Con content developers to get over. Uh, to, to, to essentially get that game to release. Each team had a group of six people working on a zone. Um, the content that they were doing is more technically complex than uh, a decent amount of the stuff that's happening on Lotro, but to give you an idea, a single person is responsible for what would amount to two teams' work over on Lotro and has tools that work in a way which they can make that. Um, yep. Um, and so with efficiency and tools and also with a much smaller team, uh, that team makes it with one tenth of it. Like it's, Oh yeah. It's, uh, and you know, these are, this is a smaller game, uh, game group, which, which puts this together. Like there's, uh, like we have, we have, great and fantastic and capable things, but we are a smaller studio. I do find it funny though, because, um, <clears throat> you know, you think about like scale, Dungeons and Dragons Online and Lord of the Rings Online are both like smaller games population wise. There's like less yep. players than like the larger players in the scene. But Lord of the Rings is like always referenced when it comes to like size of game because it's, yep. it's just huge. It's just yeah. like, if you get a chance to walk across the, the entire game, there's so much game. And it's also, yep. it's not something where like the, the landscape feels like generic or it's copy and pasted. It feels yep. so, every area feels so distinct with all these small areas and secrets and stuff hidden everywhere. Um, it, it like, it's always shocking to me how huge it is. Uh, and then same and, thing with DDO, like, yeah, there's not that much town, but each dungeon's a whole dungeon. Like it's yep. huge. Uh, it is, uh, by far, it is some of the most interesting content to develop and to play through. Like, uh, to give you an idea, I... I play at least once a week, if not... Uh, so, at least once a week, normally two times a week, 
Uh, and there have been times when I've been playing six, seven days a week uh, and just playing through content, leveling, TRing. Um, mm -hmm. my, my friends are more all itis people than actually past lives people. I know they're wrong, but that's just <laughs> how they like playing. No, man, um, you got to make alts. It's, so, it's fun. Sometimes yeah, you got to yeah. start a new build. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, uh, and since, uh, and, you know, it's just the type of content you get to play is so much different. And, uh, it is, yeah. It's, ex it's exciting. Like, we, we get to do things that, that other game companies don't really have an opportunity to do. And also, uh, it's fun. Do you have any dungeons in DDO that you find are like either examples of like, Maybe not an ideal dungeon, but like something that you're like, damn, this was like, a, this was good work that, got, that came out. Uh, there are a whole bunch of them. Uh, I have a deep love of framework. Um, I most do of the, like framework. Uh, most of the draw pack minus maybe undermine. I don't care for the mines. I love the theme. I don't. I like, like the undermine. Mines. Um, but um, I love that content. Um, it's interesting because some of the stuff is theme wise. I think is is killer like i love the theme of the carnival but the execution on some of the dungeons uh not always my favorite in certain specific uh, circumstances but yeah. um i'd agree on that actually uh, uh i like a lot of the stuff that we've been coming out like i think ravenloft is real solid i think that it's atmospheric i think death house might be one of the better intros to uh, a game setting that i've seen content wise just for, Death House for is the fantastic. feel, like just, just great content. Um, let's see, there's a bunch of different stuff. Um, a couple of the Feywild dungeons. Um, uh, the one with the uh, the gingerbread. Uh, golem. oh, the gingerbread golem. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Ice Mount Curse. Feywild I do like Ice Mount Curse. That's a good quest. Yes. Uh, Feywild was one of the few expansions that since we've been in SSG that I didn't work on DDO for it. Um, and so... Because uh, you were working on Lord that, of the Rings at the time, I guess. Yeah, I was working on Lord of the Rings. Yep. Um, uh, and there's there are a lot of different ones that I just, like... Every once in a while, you run into it, and you're just like, oh, I just, like... There's some dungeons that I worked on that I have a deep fondness for. Uh... Like, I also I imagine probably there's been situations where either you've taken breaks and moved over to Lord of the Rings and then come back and then been like, oh, so, like we could do this or like this is in the game. Yeah, yeah. And um, and seeing, given a different setting, what the team came up with for, uh, for Feywild and like given the expanse of sort of that play thing, I think that some of those, those uh, dungeons are super brilliant. They're super fun. Um, yeah. uh, what else am I liking? I was gonna say actually, in terms of in terms of optionals, I think that probably the quest, in my opinion, that does optionals one of the best in DDO. Have you played uh, one Dame thing after another? It's like part of the Hunter Be Hunted um, quest pack. There's like the two quests and then the raid. I think so. Yes. Yeah. Um, and it's the one where you have to help Dame Alonza again, the lady from the Windmill quest. Um, yep. And so you're helping her the second time. Uh, yep. And that quest has like a few optionals in it that are just mild side paths, but there's like mm -hmm. a combat optional um, where you have to get these pixies. And then there's another optional where there's just a unicorn and a jumping puzzle. And you don't have to do it. And there's no reason to do it other than the fact that the game goads you because the unicorn says, oh, I bet you can't jump across this. And mm -hmm. I, I, to me, that's like the perfect kind of optional where the game is just saying, oh, I bet you can't do this. Um, and then you as a player just want to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I do that every time. I don't need to be told. I'm just like, jump. But then I know people that just skip it. They just grab the thing and walk away because they can't be bothered or, you know, they don't like the jumping. Yeah, no. But but uh, but it's also really challenging because some people are like, this isn't worth my time and effort. And some people are like, this is the type of content I like to do. And also, this is the speed and, you know, uh, regularity if I'm trying to do past lives and all that sort of stuff. Because then, right then, what you want to do is you want to do consistency what mm -hmm. can I do the fastest? And it, it's a whole bunch of, you know, stuff. Like, I just, like, I'm trying to think of other stuff that's really a lot of fun. Um, see, I play so much that it's kind of a blur. 
Um, I know that happens to me all the time. I, I hate it when the, it's one of my least favorite questions when somebody's like, oh, what's your favorite quest? I'm like, bro, there's like there's like 400 quests. I don't know. Uh, there's so many good ones. I don't know which one's my favorite. Yeah, yeah. But but those are amongst the, the those are like the handful of ones that I really, really like. Um, um, I'm really happy with a bunch of stuff I've done. There's a couple of things I'd love to fix up on some of the stuff I've done. Uh, uh, there's a couple of quests I wish got more playthrough than uh, them do right now. Um, one of my favorite quests that I was very happy with, uh, that needs a little love, it's, uh, Creeping Death. Oh, I Creeping loved, Death, yeah. I, I loved that quest, and I was so happy I got an opportunity to make it. There were um, some changes that were, like, earlier this year that made the quest so much more palatable. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I went, I went through and deleted a whole bunch of months. I think yeah. that's what I. Cause... I mean, I, I will freely admit that that, in my opinion, <clears throat> was like the beginning of this trend I didn't like in DDO that lasted for like two and a half years, where it felt like every quest was um, monsters and hallways, where to get to the next hallway you have to kill all of the monsters, no exceptions, and that mm -hmm. quest was like this big. Um, it caused a problem because if you, you know, there's like 13 kobolds and then they all go in different directions. And if you don't, until all of them are dead, the door doesn't unlock. And then once the door unlocks, you go to the next room. What's in it? More kobolds. And when you kill them, the next door unlocks where it's just unlocking doors one after another. And I think that was probably to combat the active trend where people were just using invisibility to skip most of quests for a long time. Um, but yep. it, it was like a two year period where every quest ended up being all the monsters need to die before you can progress. And it just felt like, you know, if you're playing like, you know, you don't want to kill every kobold thrower because they don't walk. They just stand still. Or you are playing character that's like stealth oriented and you can't even sneak past them because you're stuck. Um, yeah. I, and, and it's one of those things like, um, I think that that was a bit of an overcorrection on our side. And also at the time, uh, some of our theories about monster pods and stuff like that, like the monster groups were too large. Um, but it's also stuff that we learn, you know? Yeah. I mean, the quest you know, is way we better now. And I still love Garko sliding around in the cube. Yeah, yeah, um, I I deeply love that that whole work. I'm, I love that if you can stare at him long enough, you'll see bubbles come up in the gelatinous cube. Oh, I didn't know that. I never get that close. I have never <clears> died to Garko ever. Mm, never. Mm. Never. It doesn't matter that never. I've done it on camera. No, no, no. Not not uh, not on camera. I still feel bad for people that died to that one on hardcore though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That one's uh that that's uh, sort of a, a rough uh, rough pull. When people are like, "Oh, hey, I'm gonna do this," and they're like, "You're gonna really do the instant death quest on uh, on hardcore?" Yeah, well, so there's a there's a nasty bug that can happen to you right at the beginning. I don't know if you know about this one. So, the bridges in DDO, when they lower, there's a one frame where they go from being up to being down, um, or like there's a gap, and during that gap, there's no collision because you have an invisible wall that blocks you, and then you have the floor. And in that one frame, if you're running against the bridge when it comes down, you slide through it, fall down, and instant die. Because you slide through the bridge. Um, it happens to all the bridges in DDO. They all do this. Um, yep. And usually it's not too big of a deal because it'll be like, oh, you fall in like a gap and you pick it up. But there it's instant death. And uh, yeah, yeah. I've seen some people and, die to that on hardcore. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, the thing that I would, would A, suggest is that uh, uh, slow down. Yep. Um, it, it's okay. You don't need to be actively pushing against the, the, the bridge to do it. Um, you probably know better. And if you don't, I'm sorry, you have learned a, a horrible and, and rough <laughs> lesson. What a lesson. <laughs> uh, and, um, yeah. Uh, and you chose to play hardcore and, uh, those were some choices. Yeah. I tell people that one all the time when that happens, I'm, or like when we get to places, I'm like, don't do this cause you're going to die. And then I wait. Fortunately, no one's died in my group to that, but someday somebody might. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then also, of course, every time you run that quest, I do want a gelatinous cube as a mount where you slide around inside of it like Arco. That'd be so good. That'd be great. I don't know how it would jump, but I don't even care. See. Maybe it can't jump. I, Maybe well, it just slides. You see what I would do sooner is I would put a saddle on a small one and have it like skittle along underneath you oh or what about gelatinous cube skates oh do you have like a cube on each foot and you just skate around mm -hmm. yeah these are okay. great ideas 
be good times. Good times. Yeah, that that quest is that quest is pretty good. Um, now nowadays. Um, but 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 you know, every once in a while, you have a, a really silly idea for a quest that you don't think will ever get made. It's it, it's fun to sort of think about like those different bits and. Yeah, um, the I, I just think about like the content in DDO and how different it is. I I really wanted to. I don't want to talk too much about it because obviously it's new content that hasn't come out yet. But I mm -hmm. think the the planar ice quest, the previous ones were really good. Yep. The four that we got in the previous pack. Um, yep. Some people, I know some people really dislike the um, the nightmare quest. The uh, oh, was I it love Dalcor that quest. one. I love oh, that quest. I think it's great. Uh, um, I th I think that that got there was a polish pass that was done right before it released. Um, which made it a little clearer to do one or two different things for that change, I think. But you might need to be a little closer to the mic. Oh, sorry. Um, there were a couple of changes made uh, late in the Lamania process on that one, which I think uh, made it a little clearer. And I, I love that quest. I've yep. I've literally run it hundreds of times because I think that there's two or three different pieces of gear that drop in it. So. Well, it's got one. There's the sights of the seat sleepwalker goggles, which are the accuracy, deception, seeker, yep. Uh, yep. potency goggles. Which I I love playing hybrids, so I use those all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and then and then it has the uh, fire stick, right? The fire Deceptive stick. One. Yep, that's from there. Yeah. And then there's also mm -hmm. some intelligence boots as well. Um, for me, yeah. I like that quest for many reasons, not just because whenever. I, like I, people join my quest, they start moaning about how they hate it, and then I lead them yep. through, and they still get lost. But also, I ran the quest I want to say 10, 12 times, mm -hmm. and then I find a secret door I had never found, and then there's Nibbles is hiding, yep. uh, like the uh, you know the and I was like, why is this or the no is it Nibbles or is it the giant squirrel from Fable? There's a giant squirrel just hiding in the, yep. in the raid, and I was like, what is happening? Yep. How did this thing get here? And how did I miss this so many times? Um, which is what I get for playing characters that never have any search or spot. Because that's for other people. That's for other people, exactly. Um, um, but I dig that. Uh, I dig that fight. Um, or I, 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 I actually, uh, I really, really like that quest. Uh, and um, it'll be, it'll be cool to see uh, what people uh, think of uh, the next pack. And. Um, around the lawn uh the, the lamani going up uh i think tomorrow um will be uh will be fun to watch yeah because i i know that like of the three quests man the the three that i played i know there was obviously some some polish that needs to be put in a few certain areas and i posted my feedback about them um but mm -hmm. the three that i played were just they were very good i i had a great time um the, uh, to me, it was the theming that got it the most of how each mm -hmm. one really, you, you can tell that the eye is influencing the area, so I'm, yeah. uh, I'm stoked. Because yours hasn't debuted yet. Is it going to debut in the next Lamania, or is it is uh, yes. still Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll be there tomorrow. Um, there's still some uh, the uh, I've got a checklist of things I need to do. Uh, there, I've got some uh, deco I need to do on the uh, devil section. Um, the uh, two of the Boss fights need a little, uh, little something, something, mm. uh, and uh, give more help. That that usually fixes everything. Give more help. No, I try <laughs> not to do that. Uh, but but they need like ads or or something a little fun uh, to, yeah. to to make things a little more exciting. Actually, oh, that 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 was one thing I did want to ask you because you're currently designing a dungeon. Um, yep. So monster static. In the yep. process of designing the dungeon, when does that come into play? And do you so, guys use like a formula? Like this quest is level yes. eight, therefore <clears throat> the monsters are this powerful or what? Yes. So essentially the monsters are generated using a pool with a set of statting formulas based on um, the type of monster it is, uh, some background information about that, um, the, the style of monster it is, which will uh, affect essentially, does it have more hit points and armor or does it like, we have some small tuning pieces um and also if it's a caster what's the frequency it casts um mm. I, and and that's stuff that we have small adjustments on but for the most part it's done through a set of tools um we have more control over uh spell selections for for casters right. um uh but it's also one of those things is that sometimes we get a little extra something something for them uh and it's always great to see um but it doesn't always happen 
right? So like if you were say you had a dungeon and it had hobgoblins in it, you could select between the you know the big melee beefy hobgoblin or the bow hobgoblin, and they would have different subsets of stats that you yep. would be given based on the monster type. Oh, uh, and I am not certain that Lamania will be tomorrow, but I believe it. Yeah, it was Wednesday last time. So yeah, so I. I mean, I, we all we all knew there was new Lamania on the way. So yes, th- there is Lamania theoretically this week, sometime soon. I think yeah. it's tomorrow, but I don't, don't, don't. Uh, no, it is not. Today. Yeah, that's right. Um, Lamania um, um, in ten minutes. Let's go. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, unless you're somewhere which is twelve hours time yeah. shifted from East Coast. Yeah, Australians uh, are probably on Lamania already, but. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They live in the future, man. It's it's too much for me. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's uh, that's cool. I I know that like this is obviously a sticking point, um, for me as somebody who I like I get to interact with new players all the time, which is very mm-hmm. cool because people will not know what the heck's going on. They Google search some stuff, they find my videos, they come to my live stream, and they go help. Um, and I find it great. But the um. The thing I always get stuck on is like, especially some some of the recently the new content, like since like Salt Marsh and stuff, the low level content is like it's like murder for new players, um, uh, especially it's... by contrast where it's not it's I even if that was like the whole game, <clears throat> I feel like that would be fine. But you go from like you know the harbor with kobolds who are like you know sixty health or something, or the hoggoblins who have like eighty health, and then you go to Salt Marsh where everything is two fifty to three hundred, and it's like whoa, what happened? Uh, it's something that we have to pay attention to and do better. Yeah. Because, like, especially when it comes to the new stuff, I ha- I didn't test any of the heroic things um, on Lemania. I only tested the legendary ones. And it was great. I loved it. I had an awesome time. Oh, wait, or did yeah. I do the heroic? Yeah, you know, I can't remember my own life. I don't think about it. I think, I think I these the are 16, 17, 18. Yeah, they're 16. They're 16, I think. Yeah. Because um, it's right around Sharn ish. No, it's right around when the other stuff. I actually mm. am very happy about more 16s. Because um, mm-hmm. then it means I can stop trying to run into the kobold every life. Which I don't Aww. know why I keep doing. I keep running it and then failing into the kobold and getting frustrated. Do you know that the uh, front portion of Enter the Kobold, when I first started on DDO in 2007, was the first thing that I did for the company? The uh, The entire, like track section that leads up to the big base Mm -hmm. uh that was an intro dungeon uh that essentially they were like for your first week you get to make dungeon stuff and learn how to do deco and place a whole bunch of stuff and uh that is uh uh, the first portion leading up to the mouth and the the cave which i made uh that was uh that was the first thing that i did on the team would you believe that i uh, told that story when I ran into the kobold on Friday. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah, I um, I I ran the quest, and then I, as I was walking past, I was like, "By the way, did you know, no, Bob, who's gonna be here next week?" Uh, not nice, nice. Uh, clearly, I missed that that particular stream. Yeah, well, it's just it's there's um, I find the the, the process that goes through it because you have like a lot of trial and error of stuff that works and mm-hmm. doesn't work. Um, when it comes to you know, creating a dungeon just like you would anything, trying to figure it out, and um, and just hearing about the process of how people get started with stuff, I find deeply interesting. That's why I find this conversation very interesting as well. Like, mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, it's fun getting a chance to chat about this sort of stuff. Um, yeah. one of the things, uh, uh, one of the things is that I'm sure in the future, um. When you reach out, we'll see if uh, we can get knocked back over here and uh, oh yeah, have absolutely. him have him chat up because uh, he always likes talking about stuff and um, he does a lot of the bo work. He does a lot of uh, the specific uh, uh, he he does a lot of the storytelling stuff and and a bunch of that stuff. It's great. Um, and yeah. to be fair, when you were talking way, way back when about people which showed up and started watching your stream trying to learn how to play, that was me when I first rejoined the DDO team. I'm like. Oh God, I have to relearn an MMO. How do I do that? Uh, I'm going to go to Twitch and, you know, find a couple of streamers, which are watchable, which have, uh, you know, uh, game, you know, have playable guides and are, uh, you know, fun to watch. You heard it here, folks. When you need to learn something, go to Twitch. It's a good way to do it. 
Twitch.tv slash Shrimptom specifically. Uh, it helps for DDO. Uh, yeah, I know because I, I, I did ask you if there's like other other people who were going to be available, but obviously this is after work hours, so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, in the future, like if you want to do another one of these, I'm sure a few more people would be more than happy to do so. Man. Um, well, I don't want to keep you all night because it's been, it's been two hours, which is great. Um, but I know you're still feeling sick and stuff, so. Yeah. Um, um, I, are there any other questions that you uh, have for me? Yeah. Did you guys have any uh, any questions from chat about content design that you might be curious about? Remember, Nobob is a content designer, so um, doesn't get to choose. You're not like the, I don't know, the the person who guides the ship or like system design questions, probably not not the best. Uh, you mentioned your, because you're playing, you've got Bo Rogue and then you're playing Bear Druid. Do you have any other characters on the go? Uh, I have, uh, a version of your, uh, um, I have a version of your, uh, what is it? Uh, Eldritch Knight, uh, which is right now using two sickles. Oh, cause yes, because you don't have the, the fire weapons yet. Uh, yeah, I don't have the commas this. yet. Um, and, uh, that character is so a good. lot of fun. Um, I have, uh, on the other server that I play on, uh, what do I have? I have a spell singer. Um, uh, uh, spell singer, uh, dragonborn, and then uh, I have a barbarian, a two-handed barbarian over there too. Oh, nice. Uh, uh, why, why so many plants? I I wish I knew. Um, uh, I I uh, maybe people uh, haven't been eating enough salads. That that that's the problem. That's <laughs> that's why there's all the plant monsters everywhere. People, yeah, it's like yeah. it's like it's like wake up sheeple. <clears throat> Get some more, get some more uh, plants in your diet. Yeah, um, yeah, clearly. That's funny. Do you design items, and if so, how do you decide what to add? I don't think you design items. Uh, no, I haven't uh, made items in a very, very, very long. Do you get to have uh, like input as to like what type of items go in the dungeon at all? Like you're like, oh, I have a boss who's gonna have a cool fire sword, so can somebody make a fire sword for my dungeon? <laughs> um, if something like that comes up, or if there's something specific, I'll chat with the systems designer that comes through it or if uh in my play i'm like hey there seems like there's a real need i'll chat with the folks about that sort of stuff just be like hey you might want to look at this uh like these are the two sources for this and so you might want to look at uh, options and stuff like that cool um, um another one was yeah do you accept submissions from outsiders in terms of like uh but character development ideas uh no uh yeah. the the answer the answer is um one of the challenges is is that if outside people submit things um there is actually a problem with rights for that stuff and yeah. so we can't actually use things that are submitted uh from exterior sources uh in that sort of way would love well, to i would, would assume you guys I, mean, I could be wrong about this but wouldn't you have like so for example i sometimes get art and things from people and so i have like a release form i assume you guys would have some type of like release form um like intellectual property and a number of other things. Uh, uh like there have been some problems in large suits that have come from some of that stuff along oh 100 vol- yeah. along with like volunteer working and things like that um like there was a gm program for a, a group or a guide program which went real sideways and a whole bunch of people got sued because of unpaid work and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. I feel like it's really a mis- mixed bag where you'll see some like companies that will just lift and steal like entire ideas from other or like entire literal pieces of art like on Facebook when you see an ad for like some video game and it's literally just like a World of Warcraft art like it's like the Lich King on it and you're like wait a minute. That's not Warcraft but there it is. But then on the contrast you have obviously you guys where you know you you have mm-hmm. to think about these things because there are consequences. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I guess it's one of the hard parts of being an American company. Uh, yep, absolutely. Yeah, what's your favorite monster type to put in dungeons? What's my favorite type of dungeon monster type to put in dungeons? I like putting kobolds in because kobolds are fun. Uh, you can give them fun. good voice lines. Uh, our voice actress who does our voice, our kobold stuff, she's awesome. Her name's Cindy. She crushes it. Um, so there's a lot of good personality. Uh, there's a lot of wide array of different abilities they can do. Their animations are real good. Um, so kobolds are good. 
Uh, they're also tauntable and CCable. Uh, True. And tauntable I, I, and CCable. I, I like that for players. Um, um, I try to look at that. Um, I've had a lot of fun putting Bullywugs recently. They're Bullywugs kind of are great. great. I love the way they hop around when they attack you. Uh, yeah, 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 and uh, and they're uh, you know nonchalant. Hey, uh, I'm too cool for school. Uh, poses are kind of great too. Um. Oh, that's another great question. If there's there's there are a lot of monsters that aren't in DDO. What's the monster you want to work with from pen and paper? Oh. Oh, I'd love to do a flump. I think that that would be a lot of fun. A flump. Uh, I, yeah. For the for viewers at home and that are definitely not me, what is a a flump? Uh, it is, uh, I mean, that is something that you should, uh, Google up, right, essentially Google it's it. a, it's, it, it's sort of a floating, uh, semi gelatinous, uh, uh, oh, yeah. Feature oh, with, yeah. with, with, with little eyes, uh, super cute. Yeah, uh, future stream Tom's going to edit in a picture here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm a big fan of that. Uh, just a bunch of stuff. Um, yeah, those would be fun for sure. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Like, I'd have to kind of look through to see things, uh, like, I don't know, like, book tars would be interesting and fun. Um, uh, I mean, we're starting to get a bunch of stuff, which was really nice. Like, I, um, things like were bears, were rats would be real neat. Oh, the different were animals would be very cool. Yeah. I do like that. Yeah. yeah. I also, I like when you guys do alternate variations of specific monsters, where then, mm -hmm. like, uh, I'm going to reference Enter the Kobold again, but where all of a sudden it's like, oh, now you have the Paragon Kobolds, where they're like Kobolds, where they're like full armor and things, or you have, yep. like, the creatures that are like plain touch, like the fiend touched monsters and stuff. Um, yep. I love that. Um, it's actually one of the things I, I, I well, probably one of my favorite monster types in The Lord of the Rings is when they added the, the Gash High, like the fire orcs that have like the cool, yep. they're like all red and they have the cool things. I love stuff like that. Like variant monsters are very cool. Yep. Um, uh, yeah. I mean, I could go grab my Volo's Guide to Monsters and see if there's anything that pops out or my Fiend Folio, but that's a little more <laughs> way back in the day. Yeah, it's a little one there. Uh, is Reaper Mode part of the pitch when you're designing a dungeon, or do you guys not really think about Reaper Mode in the design? Um, the answer is that it isn't first and foremost in the design of the dungeon, but um, it's one of the things that we pay attention to feedback loops and while we're doing playtests. Um, if we have characters which are set up to do it, um, we like to run through just in case there's some gotchas or some real challenges with, like, if something was to spawn here or uh like some of these boss fights are real real super rough or yeah um yeah that makes sense i mean i would imagine so this is me and does not reflect the opinions of sandstone games obviously but mm -hmm. i i would appreciate it if like the design was never focused on reaper mode but was more focused on like elite and the general player experience and then the fact that Reaper Mode exists and you can make it harder on yourself is just something that players who want to make it harder on themselves can experience. Like the content uh, is tailored as most for like the normal hard elite crowd and then the other stuff gets hit, gets hit later. Uh, that's mostly true, but there there's some just occasional things like just just be mindful of, hey, you know, if this room happens to spawn as champions or stuff like that, like yeah. there, could, there can be some real unintended side consequences if you you know you put one too many red names or you know one you know be like haha i'm putting a red name in the middle of this pack it maybe isn't the best idea across the board but additionally for reaper it's kind of an extra nice little uh you know punch you guys have the ability to because obviously you know you can determine how hard something is for normal hard and elite so how many monsters spawn in each version when you're designing a dungeon can mm -hmm. you also have a separate modifier for reaper mode or is that not a thing like imagine that like if you're on elite there's whatever and then on reaper mode now there's actually not only is it reaper mode but there's like two bosses like or something uh, like that we can hand do that but it's a, a decent amount of additional work to get that to work okay. so it would be going above and beyond so if it's something like uh uh, yeah, it, it just would be additional work to, to, to think of that. Like, 
a lot of times stuff like that is thought of more for raids or things like that mm -hmm. as a portion of the the difficulty curve and as it kind of scales up past elite yeah it was because usually ddo the complexity stops at elite difficulty reaper gives you mm -hmm. more numbers but it doesn't add complexity and i wasn't sure if that was like a, a systems limitation of like you know we can't add in new things or if it's more of a um just you know you're you don't add in more complexity with reaper mode as the concept uh kind of as a concept but um if there was something specific we might but mm -hmm. like um it's more of a a standalone system that we just have to pay attention to in case there's any gotchas yeah that makes sense i'm trying to imagine like yeah, it's, uh, I don't know why, but my brain... Again, it's because I just play too many other video games that have all these systems. You know, like when you play World of Warcraft on, like, Mythic or or even, like, mm -hmm. Lord of the Rings on, like, the, the different tiers and stuff. And then you mm -hmm. go to the higher tier, and now it's like, oh, by the way, you have to fight two bosses, or they have, like, ten new attacks or something. Um, and, of course, it's... DDO is so hard, because making comparisons to other games doesn't really work, oftentimes. Yeah. Um, it's like how, um, you know, every game has, like, tank heal and DPS... And then DDO mm -hmm. just has people doing the dungeon. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I hope maybe someone has a heal button that'll sometimes help you. Yeah, maybe exactly. You're, you're, maybe you have good enough CC that you don't have to worry about that. Or, you know. Oh, that's yeah. actually a great question when it comes to healing and stuff. Um, shrines. How do you mm -hmm. determine where the shrine goes in the dungeon or which shrines or which dungeons even have shrines? Uh, the answer is that it's really up to the content designer. Um, if they're uh, essentially a certain way through an amount of playthrough is you sort of get a feel for it. And if you're, you sometimes aren't really onto it depending on the size of the monsters, but it's, it's sort of like into it. Hmm. Um, it is something that we like feedback on. If it's like, Hey, this, this dungeon doesn't have enough, uh, rest shrines, just, just, you know, while you're going through on Lamania, uh, make a little note for that. Um, it's important. But other than, like, other designers, what about you personally? Is it just you kind of, you've been doing it for a long time so you can intuit where they're supposed to go, or? Yeah, yeah. essentially what it is is um, I try to make sure that uh, given a certain number of packs of monsters at a certain point, I'm like, this is about time when I'm going to be, uh, uh, th that I should put one in. Or, um, or this is a thematically decent location to put it in, given the appearance of stuff. Yeah, and there are I, times oh, there, there are times we miss, and sometimes like some things, uh, sometimes we don't do as good of a job. But um, I do it pretty early in the past, just that way I get feedback on it. Yeah, and well, I know that like going back to an easy example, the most recent update with Temple of Evil, <laughs> the first quest had like no shrines in it. Yep. Um, and then there were shrines that were added, which did a great job of like streamlining the whole thing, and it, it completely changed the dungeon. Um, yep. When that was that was some actionable feedback that I got. How do you find, um, especially when it comes to Lamania? Obviously, people test a lot of different things. From personal experience, um, it's usually you go into the dojo to like find out where the new quests are and to check your character, and then you find half of the population attacking kobolds. Um, do you guys find, like, obviously, obviously you still do it, but how do you find the reception from, like, tet putting quests on Lamania? Um, I wish we got more feedback. I wish we got more uh, targeted pieces of, hey, this is something I dug. This is, or even, uh, I liked it, like, you know, it was pretty smooth. Um, if there are any specific monsters or bumps, or if there are any real difficulty portions essentially um there have been entire lamania feedbacks where i've gotten three sentences as feedback um it's yeah. sort of before you kind of went through and have been playing more of them and a few more streamers have been doing a little bit more of it um i know a lot of people are like hey i don't want to spoil the content yeah that's what, that's the hardest part I, right I, I like i feel that but the challenge is um uh, the challenge with that is uh, is that that feedback will really help us flesh out different pieces of the, the dungeon which aren't hitting as well as they can. Yeah, that's that's pretty much why I always like run through and then give feedback on the content because um, I just I don't know how many people do that versus how many people 
either read about it exclusively or like log in and only look at like a couple of things because you know you don't really want to get spoiled unlike the content as well um which which is also it's also complicated um plus also i think like it, it's harder for me as well with variable levels of skill pretty much every character i run through on the mania is probably going to like smash whatever quest comes through um yeah. but i have a feeling that you're probably missing the feedback from people who are like maybe a little bit less experienced who struggle more on some of the adventures where they're like yeah. You know, I don't know what's going on, and, and that could also become important, too. Um, yeah. it's, I just I do notice that, like, when you're looking at the Lemania threads, you have, like, the systems threads, which have, like, 30 po pages now. Um, and then there's, like, two pages, maybe, of the um, actual uh, quests. On, uh, on a good release. On a yeah. real good release. There have been times when my, uh, when my quest had never been mentioned over three Lamania, I think it was over three Lamanias, my quests were never mentioned in any piece of feedback. Yeah. And and you're like, and then afterwards when it gets released. And then the second like, it gets released, all the bugs. And yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Or not yeah, even bugs, yeah. just somebody's like, well, why wasn't this happening? You're like, oh man, good idea. Yeah. Oh. And then the other thing too, I think is also very hard is when people are happy, they just don't say anything. I mean, you make a good bully wonk dungeon that people think is fun and is entertaining and has good feedback and has good direction and you get, ooh, bully wugs, and then and then that's the end of it. Uh, I don't know why I'm just imagining you just like, you know, in the shower, just like, just like the bully wug quest was good. I know the bully wug quest was good. Nah, uh, I, I, I knew that that was going to be a fun quest. Like, I think a lot of that, like, it's it's one of those things is that like <clears throat> the way that this game is built, the content is very important and is very hand tuned, but the builds and build meta like captures people's imagination in a way that um, that really grips and and is is something that really leads to longevity of players. So, yeah, well, I yeah. guess it's complicated too because like when a quest comes out, the quest is 20 to 30 minutes doing mm -hmm. all the optionals. And then once you've done that, that first experience is gone. So you can do it again, but the first time you did it, it's gone. So a whole quest back is like two and a half hours, but like a new class or a new enhancement change, or even a balance change might shift, you know, 30 hours with a character. And so I can see why people kind of laser focus onto that more than the, the quest as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's tough. It's a it's a tough position that you're in. I do have a question. I don't know if you can answer this, so it's okay if you can't. Um, is there a reason why there isn't an incentive program for people to log in and, and try these things to be like, hey, thank you for participating in our Lemania program. Here is a thing that you get for participating uh, in our Lemania program. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I, I think that I, I think know. that there I think there is a reason. I think it has to do with wacky giveaway stuff slash incentivization for players doing things. Mm -hmm. um, it might be something legally, but I am not 100% sure. Yeah, I guess I, I can speculate, but I have no idea. So I'd rather just go to like, you know, the source. But yeah, because that's obviously a, a, a complicated, a complicated thing. I mean, asking people, especially to go on these, you know, playing playing other video games as well. And they'll usually have like, um, testing areas and testing things, and I, I don't know how many others actually do any any type of incentive, but mm -hmm. yeah, it would be, you know, it can be kind of tough sometimes. Yeah, the the paid labor thing is 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 actually a real uh, challenging thing. Yeah, as a portion of uh, of our industry. Yeah, well, hey, you got to pay people for their work, right? And then yeah. if you start telling people, hey, check this out, um, come do this bit of content, and then. Does that qualify as work? I have no idea. Yeah, exactly, right? I'm not a lawyer, so... Yeah, like... <laughs> and you you know what conversations I never want to have as a portion of work is talking to lawyers oh, about... Oh, 100%. Yeah, <clears throat> it's like, like not, hey, nah, fam, I'm, I'm good on that. Yeah, I make, I make dungeons. I don't do this. Uh, like... <laughs> yeah, that's very true. Very true. Um... Yeah, that makes sense. 
Um, uh, uh, when we do internships, we always do paid interns. Yeah, pay people for their work. Jeez. Yeah. Do you just end game a dungeon full of lawyers? That's a dungeon coming out. Coming to a dungeon near you. So uh, I will tell you, I will tell you that my friends uh, are really trying to push me, uh, my play group, uh, to make a dungeon. I don't think it'll ever happen. Okay. Um, but it's a joke dungeon. Uh, oh yeah. The trial of the Triceratops. Um, <laughs> and what it is is uh, as opposed to uh, the trials but, of the Triceratops. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Instead of trials of the Triceratops, and uh, poor uh, Crimson Foot uh, gets uh, charged for uh, stamping. Uh, Stomping all of those people, and you have to put a a well a well, uh, a, a well uh, documented and uh, uh, you know impassioned defense uh, with a poor triceratops standing there with maybe a tie on. That's a great idea. I could also imagine that being like a PvP dungeon, where you have some people oh, yeah. on the defense and some people on the prosecution. It'd be good. It'd be real, real good. Oh man. Yeah, or or a festival dungeon like for Halloween or something. Oh man. Oh. If we, could do, good idea. if we could do April Fool's Dungeons, it'd be fun. I mean, honestly, there's a lot of different stuff that will be fun for uh, uh, for Night Revels. Yeah, I... we, have an intern we have an internal name for Night Revels, and so if it ever looks like we're stumbling over the words Night Revels, it's because we're thinking of that other thing. The I was going to say, because Didio has like a you have the Halloween event now, so the Night Revels. Yep. There's the festival with the slide... Mm -hmm. And the ice mountain climb, both fun. Um, but there's no like spring event, yep, or anything. I don't think there's a spring holiday, but there's still no spring event. Um, we do anniversary in February. Oh, but we anniversary, don't do... yeah. Um, but we could probably do a little uh, extra something because Sometime. I always think of I I think of like the how Lord of the Rings. There's like the spring event, the summer event, the fall event, and the winter event. Uh, um. And one of the challenges is that recently uh, that's falling right before when we've done expansions. Oh, because then you have the event come out and then you have the expansion come out and it kind of like takes away either some of like you spend development time on the event as opposed to the expansion or it takes away mm -hmm. some of the interest because people are already playing now. So they're not going to be playing then. Yep. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. I'd never even thought about that. Because, yeah, you guys usually do expansions like May and November. Some, like around that time frame, somewhere in there. Although I guess Isle of Dread. Yeah, Isle of Dread was like June. So, yeah, that makes sense. I was just thinking about also the, especially when it comes to the events, it probably is like a whole bunch of, like, I don't really mind the fact that there's no real event that goes on during uh, the, the the springtime, especially because there's like Crystal Cove is kind of flexible. So if you ever yep. don't have anything, you just be like, hey, by the way, Crystal Cove. Um, and there's also been smaller events in DDO, like mm -hmm. the, um, actually, this is, this is a question. How do you feel about optional difficulty events in the game as somebody who designs the dungeon, but nothing else? So uh, as an example, um, the mimic hunt is now in your dungeons that you made, or because obviously it's turned on, uh, or um, there was like an event where the champions from I think from season two of Hardcore were suddenly showing up in the regular world as opposed to, you know, for I think it was like for two weeks or something. It was like some special champion hunter event. Um, do you how do you feel like when it comes to you know just general game design question? Do you think that's good or bad? Have those types of like intermittent uh, I, difficulty uh, spikes that might happen to some people. Um, I, I dig it. I know that sometimes it's a point of frustration. Really, like it gives the the content a little more extendability. It gives it a little different flavor. Um, you know, people are running some of these dungeons tens to hundreds, thousands of times. Oh man, and I so don't want to know how many times I've done most dungeons in this game. That's information I don't want. I know. Uh, it'd be be super. I'd be super curious, um, but uh, but like um, I don't mind those types of flips. Like uh, for like first pass playthroughs, I probably wouldn't want to do it like when I first release a pack, just because I want people to kind of get a sense of it and not have it mired True. by that. Yeah, like but... imagine if somebody's playing like their quest, a quest mm. that they haven't done before on hardcore the first time. So they've got the mm -hmm. hounds, so they can't take their time and experience it. They have to kind of rush. 
and it changes the mm -hmm. nature of how you engage with the content. That's very true. Um, someone was mentioning doppelgangers. One of the problems with uh, player stats versus player stats in any of our PV stuff, like if I was to ever copy a player, uh, the, both characters would kill each other in like three swings in whatever direction. It's just yeah, it's it, it, it's. This game is not built for PvP. Yeah, it, imagine it, like you don't know that's coming. So you're just in the yeah, dungeon yeah. and you're playing like a sorcerer and then you walk through and then boom, lightning <clears> bolt. Uh, what are you talking about? Like you're in epics and you're just like, what am I about to get hit by? Oh, someone's going to fucking, uh, uh, sorry, my bad. Uh, you uh, you are more than gonna, welcome to curse on the stream. It's all good. Uh, is, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm just going to, you know, use the, uh, the, the epic uh, breath weapon and just be like, Hey, there's 40k damage. You can take that, right? That that's totally like walk yeah. awayable. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think I think the only way we would have PvP is in like competition style events in any way. If it was like yep. quest completion, so like server versus server, who can complete this quest the most times, or like a turn in, or like a goofy festival event. You know, like you remember there was the ice skating event that used to be around where you collect the coins. So it'd be yep. like you and another person are both trying to race to see who gets the most coins. Something like that would probably be the only way you could have like real PvP in DDO. Uh, yeah. Or, or you know, uh, you know, level one, give them, uh, you know, basic pit. Oh yeah, level have, ones. Have, yeah. Uh, yeah. Fight, yeah, fight, yeah. fight. I love that idea. The ship, the shipwreck fight in DDO. Mm -hmm. Oh man. Uh. I was going to say, do you, I don't know if you know this, do you know if you guys track um, playtime on accounts? Because it's not displayed on any characters. Um, but do you know if that information exists? Uh, I am uncertain. I would not be surprised if we do. Because on, I know I in Lord also... of the Rings, you can type slash played and it tells you exactly how long your character has been in the game for. I... I would not be amazingly surprised if we do, but I am not a hundred. Yeah, no, no worries. I was, it was mostly just if you knew, because like that's the twisted part of my brain where I'm like, I want to know. I kind of want to know, but that's why I don't have DDO going through Steam, so I can't know. <laughs> uh, also, you know, we appreciate you not putting DDO through. Oh, that's funny. Um, uh, if people wonder, it's real nice if you don't play through Steam. Haven't made an account through Steam. Download the standalone client. Go to ddo.com and download your version of the client today, where you can not only see the updated news about the game, patch notes, and other things coming to the game, and also your ability to buy expansions and stuff, ddo.com. That's ddo.com. ddo.com. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I appreciate that, right? Yeah. Okay, well, I think we've pretty much covered all the topics, at least for today. Maybe we'll come back with like another more focused discussion about yeah. something or hit it up or maybe um, something else. But uh, at some point, uh, it would be very cool uh, if I was in a different place in a dungeon. Um, what I could do, uh, maybe uh, one other time I could uh, kind of fly around my tool, show people a little bit about that. Oh, that'd be kind of cool. Yeah, actually, like, to demonstrate some of it, that would be very cool. I think a lot of people would like to see how some of the things look on, like, the back end as well. Yeah, I, I, the, the only challenge is that uh, the fear when we do that sort of thing is people like, oh, that's really easy. You could do this and this and this really easy. Um, you would oh, like yeah. to think that, but, like, it's, uh, but I think it would be fun. Yeah, um, it turns out you have to, well, I mean, but to be fair, that's also the people that, like, you know, watch an athlete do something. And they're like, oh yeah, they can they can totally do this. Like watching somebody do um do like the moguls when they're skiing and be like, oh, they mm -hmm. should have done this when it's like, yeah, it's that easy, a hundred percent. Just going Absolutely. over the just going down at full speed, but going over bumps of ice is is very easy. Same thing. Uh yeah, I think that would be kind of cool. Or also possibly, I don't know if you would be interested in this, but um you're more than welcome to come on when I run through a dungeon if you want. Like one of like when there's new Lamania dungeons. Oh yeah, yeah. That. that'd be fun. Um, we can go through it kind of together. Yeah. Um, I tend to. Uh, uh, the only challenge with that is that I'm listening a lot when you're when you're playing through stuff. So yeah, I, you're lurking. I, yeah, I'm lurking and I'm taking notes. Yeah, uh, and 
spreading those links around uh, because uh, for folks that do do streams, uh, we watch, we like, well, we look at what people are finding and all of that sort of stuff. Yeah. Well, it could also be like sort of like a walkthrough of like, what were you thinking at this point? What was the inspiration for this? And kind of like break down individual segments. That could also be kind of cool. Yeah. yeah. I think that for some dungeons, that'd be a little more interesting than others. Hmm. I think some of them are a little more meat and potatoes and some of them are a little more. Yeah. Oh, hey, I was trying to do something really cool and it either worked or didn't work or this was the work of another person. Maybe they would want about like their, their inspiration for why they wanted to do this. Yeah. Well, because, and exactly as you said, I think that not, not everything needs to be super complicated. There are a lot of people that do like, as you said, those meat and potatoes dungeons where you, it's yep. very clear cut. You go in, there's some hallways, there's some treasure chests, there's some monsters, and, you know, we all have a good time mm -hmm. um, with some good voice acting. And then some people want, you know, try to try to figure out the puzzle in House of Pain. Um, and there's a lot of, there's a lot going on between those two different things. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, man. Well, we'll definitely have you back on here. Um, in yeah, the yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, I hope uh, you folks uh, have a good time. And I uh, hope, uh, you know, thanks so much for having me. And it's always fun getting a chance to chat a little bit about uh, game development and game design and content. Yeah, it's one of those things where it's it's fun. It's fun to chat about. Um, and so I, for me, obviously, I don't, I'm not in it all day. Like I play the game, but uh, mm -hmm. hopefully it's not <laughs> too much to like finish work and be like, Okay. Uh, focus, yeah. No, no, it's, it's great. It's a fun time. Um, and thanks so much, uh, everybody who's watching for uh, checking this out. Really yeah, and if you missed any of this, uh, it's going to be on YouTube tomorrow. So you'll be able to watch it tomorrow morning. Uh, the whole thing will be up there, and you'll be able to check that out then.